Good evening and welcome to our 2021 City of Grand Prairie Municipal Election All Candidates Forum. My name is Dan Wong and I'm the past chair of the Grand Prairie and District Chamber of Commerce. Thanks for taking an interest in the leadership of your city government and taking the time to be here today. The Grand Prairie and District of Chamber of Commerce represents nearly 1,200 businesses in this region. We work alongside those members, special interest groups, and all three levels of government to ensure the voice of business and matters affecting them is heard and considered. The election of city officials has the potential to greatly affect not only businesses, but everyone that calls Grand Prairie home. Today is as much about you as city residents, business owners, parents, and taxpayers, as it is about those seeking your votes. We'll hear the candidates' thoughts on the issues facing our community and future council, and look to you, the online audience, to ask the questions that matter in your lives. On behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, a sincere thank you to all the candidates for being here today and to the public for helping us get ready for the election on October 18th. Now let's review the format and rules for this evening. The forum will begin with an introduction of all candidates for council, followed by a question period using the Slido app. Closing statements from the councillors, from the councillor candidates will follow. Then we will repeat the format for all candidates for mayor. Before we start hearing from your candidates, let's review the rules. At 610, question period begins for council candidates. Questions will be submitted using Slido. Instructions are on the screen. All names of the councillor candidates have been placed in a draw box. Three names will be drawn from the first box. The questions will be the question will be read to the three candidates. Each councillor candidate will have one wild card that can be used to answer any question coming forth at the forum. The wild card can only be used once and must be immediately called after the question is read by unmuting yourself, saying wild card and stating your name. Just a reminder that any answers deemed inappropriate, offensive, or derogatory, or that would seem to attack the integrity of any candidate or individual will be ruled out of order. Answers to questions for all candidates, both the councillor session, excuse me there, answers to questions for all candidates, both the councillor session and the mayoral session will be limited to 45 seconds in order to maximize the number of questions that can be fielded in the time allotted. The timer will be given a green screen to start, a 15 second, at 15 seconds, a yellow warning screen, and then a red screen at the end of the allotted time. A bell will sound, then the candidate will be muted. At approximately 7.35, question period will end. Councillor candidates will then have an opportunity for closing statements to respond to issues that have been presented throughout the forum or to summarize their platform. Councillor candidates will have one minute each. The timer will start with a green screen, then give you a 30 second yellow warning screen, and finally a, a red screen at the end of the allotted time. A bell will sound, then the candidate will be muted. At approximately 7.55, we will take a five minute break to prepare for the mayoral candidate session. The format will be the same for the mayoral candidates in the second session starting at 8 p.m. with question period. The exception is no wild card is needed as all four candidates will answer each question. Answers to questions for the candidates will be limited to 45 seconds in order to maximize the number of questions that can be fielded in the allotted time. The timer again will be given a green screen to start at 15 seconds, a yellow warning screen, and then a red screen at the end of the time allotted. A bell will sound, and then the candidate will be muted. At 8.45, the question period will close, and we will invite each candidate to give closing remarks. Each will have one and a half minutes to respond to issues that will have been presented through the forum or summarize their platform. The timer will start with a green screen, then we'll give a 30 second yellow warning and a red screen at the end of the allotted time. A bell will sound and then the candidate will be muted. In all matters, the moderator will have final jurisdiction. 
So without further ado, I'd like to introduce everyone to the candidates. I'll start with the mayoral candidate in alphabetical order, starting with Jackie Clayton, Eunice Friesen, Glenn Gruner, and Brian Patrician. Now, I will introduce your candidates for council in alphabetical order, starting with Ejibola, Adedo Combo, Taiwo, Grant Berg, Gladys Blackmore, Wendy Bosch, Dylan Bressy, Tammy Brown, Melissa Erickson, Gerald Scott Hafner, Michelle Jasper, John Laners, Kevin McLean, Yad Minhas, Mike O'Connor, Solomon Okafo, Kevin O'Toole, Paul Robin, Sarvinder Singh, Chris Thiessen, and Neil Tuasson. And with that, let's begin question period. So first question goes to Neil Tuazon, Tammy Brown, and Gerald Hafner. First question is, what is your position on COVID masking, vaccination, and exemption measures, and what role do you feel City Council has in promoting public health measures? So we'll start with Neil. Uh, hello, uh, good evening to everyone, uh, fellow uh, candidates and uh, the our um, uh, good moderator, Mr. Dan Wong. Uh, first of all, I, I'm very much uh, like uh, should the uh, promoting about like more safety of uh, more people. I, rather, I, I much more believe on science rather than thinking of uh, things that uh, it's not going to work. Because like it's only for me, uh, masking is a, a protection like this PPE is really protecting us so, so that we can help other people to, to be not to be infected. I think it's really a great thing that uh, we will be using the mask. Am I still on? Thank you, Neil. Oh, no. Next, we'll go to Tammy. And you'll have to unmute yourself, Tammy. Thank you. I'm um, sorry about that. Um, COVID-19 has affected all of us um, today. and. Uh, that vaccines are so important to protect our people from illness, but I encourage it to be done nicely. Masks are good, and they help us stop the spread of, of the virus in areas that are public. Um, I also believe in our um, vaccine passports. Um, they're good for areas of travel out of the country, just like your um, health documentation is needed at that time. As for a passport that is needed within socialization activities within our community of restaurants and gyms, um, I think it spreads more discrimination within our community. I would like to address the fact that I would like to see more time put into um, the prevention of the hate and discrimination and bullying that has been. Sorry, Tammy, time's up. Thank you for your response. And finally, we'll go to Gerald. Hey guys, also, you know, basically in the beginning when I, when I, when this all started, I didn't know where I sat uh, on a personal level. You know, I'm a businessman and we have a bowling alley. You want to stay open, you want things to happen. You want the restaurants to stay open. But as things got real, I realized that, you know, we got to do what's right to solve the problem. So. Uh, you know, jumped on board right away with all of that. Our bowlers have jumped on board all, you know, with all of that, with the vaccinations and stuff. The masking thing, it, it, it's not a bad thing. It, it's just something we have to do to get through this. And uh, I don't see, you know, any issues with it. And uh, I totally believe in what's going on. I know we got to get it taken care of. 
And to do that, we all just have to be on the same page with it. It's it's uh, it's pretty important. So that's pretty. Okay, so I think everyone gets an idea of how this is going to go. We'll move on to our next question. The next three names drawn: Edubola, Dylan, Bressy, and Yad. Question number two: If elected, what would you do to increase the revenue of the city of Grand Prairie? And where would you spend the increased revenue to improve the quality of life for residents of the city? Start with Edubola. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for that question. So what would I do when elected if there is an increase in revenue? No, I believe the first question is how, where to spend increased revenue. Um, I'm somebody that has stood on a platform and one of my platform is entrepreneurship and inclusiveness. I believe that entrepreneurship is what would grow, what would help us to develop the city. And we have to start thinking of how can we attract the best talent? How can we attract the best investment? How can we bring the best um, investors to the city? That is where we should focus increased revenue. Thank you for your response. Dylan Bressy. Great. Well, thank you everybody for being here today. It's well known that Grand Prairie has relatively high residential tax rates. However, if you divide how much money the city spends by our residents, we actually spend on average and even a little bit lower than most other Alberta mid-sized cities. So we really do have a revenue imbalance in this city. I think that this requires economic development to grow our tax base, but the unpopular opinion that maybe a politician shouldn't be saying is the unfortunate reality is we need to look at increasing revenue sources that other municipalities are using and we aren't, such as a stormwater utility model is something we don't have, but most municipalities with lower tax rates than us do have. So that's a hard conversation that our next council really does have to have. Where are we going to get our revenue from? Okay. Thank you, Dylan. And Yad Minhas. Thank you for everybody tonight and wish you all good luck, all the candidates. Uh, my point is on, uh, I think, uh, covered with those two candidates. Uh, most thing we have to look for the new business to bring into Grand Prix, like geotech improvements, so we get more revenue, like utilities, power. And also, we got to be more friendly business, so bring more industry into our city, because we now we got lots of land. The first priority would be to keep our tax lower, whatever we best can to invest the money whenever we get that um, the re revenue, extra revenue come in, which is we have done last four years uh, in uh, this council we were in. And that was kind of successful because we still have 1% less tax than 2017. Thank you. Thank you, Yad. Okay, so I've just been informed that we had an incorrect Slido link on your screen for those people out there trying to submit questions. It has now been corrected. So if you look on your screen now, there is um, the right event code to Slido and you can start resubmitting your questions. So moving on, next three councillor candidates, Wendy Bosch, Kevin O'Toole, and Solomon Okafo. Question for them. When is the city going to make the owners of rental properties clean their yards? It is a disgrace to see uh, that it is just, it is a disgrace to the city to see some of these places, yet are we all to believe we live in the most beautiful city in Alberta? So we'll start with Wendy Bosch. When are we going to make owners clean their rental properties? Hi, everyone. Thank you for the question. I guess, first and foremost, we have to instill community pride in our, in our city when it comes to um, places that have work to be done. We also have to be diligent and 
when we need to require enforcement services or the city to come in and speak to these owners of these properties. It's not okay to have properties that are in dismay. We have to collectively work together. And, you know, if it's fines, then it's fines. If it's um, assistance in some other way, then we have to adapt and, and offer assistance. Um, many may not know if it's And that's time. Next, Kevin O'Toole. Kevin, if you're there, you need to unmute yourself and then answer the question. All right, sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, in Grand Prairie, we have a good neighbor policy, and that sort of touches uh, with the cleanliness of your yard, uh, the noise that's uh, possibly uh, given out at night when uh, parties are happening. So we do have that in place. Uh, when we do come across, uh, bylaw gets uh, questions or gets called to deal with an unsightly yard. Uh, first thing that they do is look for... Um, dangerous situations where it could be unsafe, like broken glass, feces, uh, petroleum products. And uh, then at that point in time, not only do we give a warning, we can take it. Okay, thank you for your answer, Kevin. Solomon. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. I think the first thing is, uh, we have to find out why are these people not cleaning their property? If they are renting it to people, it is the owners lie on the landlord or the owner of this property to get uh, to the people who are renting from them to clean it. So if they don't clean it, the uh, responsibility eventually come back to the owners. Uh, I think like Kevin said, there's a bylaw, I think, that uh, should address this. So if they don't clean it, the provision of that bylaw should come into effect immediately. Uh, just like uh, there's a bylaw that people should clean their sidewalk. If they don't clean their sidewalk, there's uh, some consequence. I don't think we need to wait. It should start right away. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon. Next three, or next three candidates are Michelle, Jasper, Christine and Melissa Erickson. And the question is, the COVID-19 situation in Grand Prairie continues to get worse and worse. If elected, what are you prepared to do in order to protect the, the people of the city? Go ahead, Michelle. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. That's a tough one. Um, just there's so much conflicting information out there on on what's going on. Um, I don't know what that's. I feel most of the regulations and stuff with COVID should be at a provincial or federal level, not necessarily municipal. So I'm not really sure how to go about answering that one. Okay, we'll take that as your answer. Uh, Chris Thiessen. Uh Thanks so much for the question. Yeah, COVID's uh, racked, I think, every community across uh, not just the province and country, but the world. Um, I think the city of Grand Prairie has done a fairly good job. Um, we've advocated for the health authorities to step in where they need to step in and make those professional decisions as they have the professionals around the table. Um, we've, uh, we were one of the early I guess the early pushers to uh, start with the lockdown in the first in the first phase. I don't think lockdowns are the best answer at this point now. Um, I think uh, we need to advocate for other solutions. Uh, and if that's a medical or clinical ways, or even just for people's mental health, I think that's probably the best thing at this point uh, city council could do. Thank you, Chris. And Melissa. Uh, thank you. First, I just want to acknowledge that uh, we're here on the traditional territories 
of the Indigenous Peoples of Treaty 8 region and the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Um, with regard to that question, what am I prepared to do? Um, my number one thing would be to follow the scientists and the experts um, and use them as our guide. Um, I guess, as Michelle mentioned, these are decisions that are made above city council. Um, so what I would like to see is council supporting the residents and business owners um, with whatever decisions come down. So if that is passports or um, masking or other things, then the city needs to support all the people in Grand Prairie. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you for that land acknowledgement as well. That was something we were remiss in doing. We should recognize that we are on traditional treaty land and that we are um, occupying the land of the uh, ancestral Beaver, Cree, Dene, and Métis people. Next three up are John Laners, Kevin McLean, and Gladys Blackmore. And your question is, cities like Edmonton have programs that enable residents to live a more green lifestyle. Example, curbside compost pickup, green home renovation grants, et cetera. If elected, what green initiatives will you champion? Well, we'll again, yeah, sorry. For, yes, okay. again, thank you to all the, the candidates who are here. Um, you know, one of the things that actually uh, drives happiness is um, this community and, and nature. And so anything that, you know, you can do that uh, enhances that. So I'm a big fan of trails. I use them every morning. I think they're, they're good for getting people out and exercising, doing all those wonderful things. Um, you know, I'm also involved in some some uh, companies that are looking at converting uh, waste energy or waste products into uh, biodiesel. So I'd be encouraging that, that group to see if they can do something here in the Grand Prairie to uh, get some uh, business opportunities and those kinds of things to try and to make, make that make sense. Hey, thank you, John. Kevin McLean. Thank you very much. I welcome everybody to uh, participate in the forum. Excellent format. Uh, that's a, a really awesome question. One thing we're very lacking in City Grand Prairie is for electrical hookup. Um, this summer I went through major areas and Fort McLeod where their subway has six spots to power your Tesla. Um, other smaller communities, we, d we really lack that in our city and that has to be looked at and brought forward. Uh, other things are solar panels. We can have more residential solar panels and find out rebates people can get from the federal government and the provincial government, and as well building codes, which as I'm a journeyman carpenter, we could do better with our building and how we build our units to make it better for the environment. And that is crucial for our building units. So I, I think there's a lot we can do. Thank you, Kevin. And on Gladys. The issues that have been raised by both John and Kevin are really great and very valid points. And I agree with what they have said. I would like to add, uh, there's a, a, a program that runs in Edmonton during the summer, which takes summer camp uh, to all of the playground areas of the city of Edmonton. So uh, I think that that's something that I would really like to see where we don't necessarily encourage people to go to Muscogee Park. I mean, that's great, but not everyone has the same ability to get there. And so if you can do that in your own neighborhoods, that's great. I also think we need to keep working on enhancing our disabled transportation. Uh, for people who have disabilities, it's really difficult to get across the city, particularly outside of business hours. And I would like to see us uh, work towards that. Okay. Thank you, Gladys. And the final names, Grant Berg, Paul Rogan, Mike O'Connor and Sarvinder Singh. And your question is, what is your position on photo radar? Go ahead, Grant. I am not a fan of photo radar. I've had my share of photo radar tickets. Uh, I do agree that it needs to be in school zones, some playground areas. But I feel if the true intent is to make people slow down or have people slow down, 
that we need to have those flashing speed signs that we see at various points in the city that say, this is how fast you're going. It's more of awareness because right now I feel that photo radar is actually punishing people just going about their daily lives and not addressing what the real problem is, is speeding. I find most of the speeding is around 2 a.m. when the photo radar guys are at home sleeping. So that's my position on photo radar. Thank you, Grant and Paul. You need to unmute your microphone, Paul. Oh, good evening, everyone. When it comes to the safety of people, I stand with every kind of measurement we can put in place. Because when I first get in Grand Prairie, my first shock was the speed of people. It seems like anyone who has a truck, it just turned like someone who is just crazy in, in the highway and everywhere. So for me, if there can be a kind of caution, how we can like make people slow down a little bit, that will be like the good thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. On to Michael Connor. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think it's important that we look at the issues around portal radar, that they're put in sneaky places. I don't think that's the right way. They should be visible and everybody should know that this is uh, an area that needs to be, uh, traffic needs to slow down. But if we're gonna do anything about safety, we need to look at school zones and engineer our uh, school zones so people do not speed through school zone. So if we're gonna have money, uh, we should be investing it in to prevention and save our children. Thank you, Mike. And finally, Sarvinder. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Photo Radar. So I've had my share too. Uh, and I would like to say, uh, I don't think so we can do anything uh, about it quite yet. I think so they have an agreement for two to three years. And, uh, but if we could, uh, yeah, we can uh, probably uh, look at uh, like color coding them or more like to warn people not to like, uh, yeah, obviously we want people to slow down. There should be like uh, something we can do. I agree on that one with uh, Mike that, yeah, there should be a, a specific color so people can actually see it and uh, yeah, slow down. Yeah, that's about it. And uh, schools won't especially, yeah, that's where we need them, yeah. Thank you, Sir So in about uh, 25 minutes, we've made it through one round of questions for our councillor candidates and no wild cards used at this point. We'll probably get through just over three more rounds. So keep that in mind as we draw the next questions. So the next three candidates to answer questions. Solomon Okifo, Ejibola, Edit of Kumbo, Taiwo, and Gerald Hafner. And your question is around the Leisure Center. With the city's decision to demolish the Leisure Center, what do you see to be a great fit for this area that would be beneficial for our community and surrounding landowners? And we'll begin with Solomon. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, I believe the Leisure Center is being demolished because the facility is dilapidated and is no longer meet, meeting the need of the community. Uh, like someone who have been advocating that we don't have another recreation facility, I will advocate that another recreation facility be put in that place because it's still very close to two schools that can make use of it and have a large community that surround that place that can make use of it. So my, my answer, put another recreation facility. Uh, cities that uh, mid-sized city like uh, Grand Perry, they have way more than Grand Perry have. Right there have about three outdoor pools. Grand Perry will have only one. So there's so much enough to look forward to in recreation facility in Grand Perry. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon. Ejibola. 
thank you for that question. I am going to lean to us, okay, we're going to demolish, but what's the plan for another one? So how are we planning to have a better one, a more functional one, one that would cater for outdoors and other recreational plans that we've got for our children, not only the children, but neighboring um, cities that are around us that can help generate um, the income and the revenue that we desire for the city. Um, we do know that other um, suburbans and smaller cities come into Grand Prairie to, to make use of our facilities. So if we are to pull one down, let's pull another one that will be more functional, one that can generate the revenue we need. Okay, thank you, Adibola. And Gerald. Well, I definitely agree with both of these people on that. Um, Grand Prairie is a sports oriented city and yes, you're getting rid of an old building, but, but, but like Solomon said, there's two schools right there. Um, it's in such a neutral area that, and I think there's three schools there now, um, but it's such a neutral area and the hospital so close, we could do so much with, uh, oh man, it's, it could be so diverse in there with what we could do with something more positive for the city. It's such a wonderful area. Hopefully they don't get rid of the track and field, you know, hopefully that stays, but they're just getting rid of the building. We can build on top of that and make that work uh, for our city because we have so many great athletes and people that want to become great athletes and what a better place for them to go and, and, and make that happen for themselves. Thanks, Gerald. Yep. Next question goes to Grant Berg. Tammy Brown. And Mike O'Connor. And your question is, do you believe in a safe injection site for our city? And if so, where should it be located? I Grant actually... Berg? Yeah, I do believe in the safe injection site. I do believe that where it sits is probably the best place. I can't think of anything better. And I do hope that we do get to retain the van that we have that is a mobile unit, as opposed to what's been suggested by the province that we put something a little more semi-permanent uh, in that spot. So I do believe that we need the safe injection site. Um, what it is, it is the last safety net for these people that have fallen through the cracks, that suffer from mental illness. And with the safe injection site, the hope is, is that eventually they can rebuild their lives and become productive citizens again. Thank you, Grant. Tammy, you're next. I agree, thank you. And I agree um, about what uh, Grant has, has said to follow along with his thoughts of, of safe injection. We should also be taking a look at safe injection within another possible spot within the community so that um, those who are further away and on the streets are able to go and do that. So folks who are in addiction will, will do these things no matter what. And in the case of this, we should make sure it's in coordination with another facility or thereabouts where they can get help in being able to repair their life and move on. Thank you, Tammy. And I should note that you are having a little bit of a connection issue. So your voice isn't coming out 100% clear. I think we can all understand you though. So that's good. Michael Connor. All right. Yes, I watched the uh, uh, presentation on the safe injection site and I do not believe it should be a permanent solution at that location. I agree that it needs to be mobile, uh, but it has to be managed and not allow people to drive there and you know, consume and then drive home. I have a bit of issue with that. Okay, thank you, Mike. So it's amazing all this technology that we have and I'm down, I'm relegated to little pieces of paper in a glass vase. <laughs> but um, the other thing that I should note is uh, maybe after I've read the question, I'm going to pause for about two or three seconds in case there are people who want to call in their wild cards, and then I will ask you to answer your questions. So, Michelle Jasper, Yad Menhaz, and Kevin O'Toole, you're up for the next question. And the question is, 
If elected, how will you continue to communicate with residents both on and offline? Seeing no wild cards, go ahead, Michelle. Um, if I'm elected, I would love to be out in the community more, just visiting local businesses out with events going on. I'd actually like to see more pop-up community events in, in different neighborhoods, just to bring more people to different neighborhoods and meet other people that they wouldn't maybe necessarily meet. Um, just make it a little bit more accessible to everyone. Um, as well, just be out there talking to people. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Next answer is Yad. Yeah, keeping the touch with the people, we should be doing more transparency, but whatever it goes in the council, we should be communicating better way. There's technology enough now, we can communicate much better. Being this uh, COVID-19 last 18 months, it's kind of sad situation, but when it's open up, like um, Shell said, you know, we should be meeting the people face-to-face -face more, which is, I believe, more than talking to face-to-face -face than phone call or um, emailing or text messaging. But uh, we need more uh, close community commission like neighborhood association. We should be meeting there and communicating what's going on in the city that give them more information. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Yad. And finally, Kevin. Thank you. Um, well, I'm an old school guy. I like to pick up the phone and talk to people, or if I have a possibility of going over and visiting them face to face, I try and do that. I bought more coffee for more people that I've never known very long, but have become relatively good source of information for them. Um, I agree that uh, I've been known to be the guy that goes to a lot of events over the last uh, 11 years being on council, and I continue to still inspired to do as much as I can. I got elected to be a counselor and if that's part of the role, that's part of the role. I've cut more ribbons with the with the chamber and uh, opened up uh, different, uh, attended many, many things. And uh, I will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Next question goes to Dylan Bressy. Chris Thiessen and Neil Toison. And we have another COVID question for you. COVID has divided our community. If elected, what will you do to help reunify people and ensure that we can move forward together as a community? And no wild cards again. So Dylan, please go ahead. Well, first of all, we need to get COVID under control. It's hard to have a united community if our ICU is absolutely overflowing, overflowing, and council absolutely has a role to play in that. Second thing I'd say is it's fair to say that I'm the member of council that gets the most heat on social media because I'm most active on social media. And I think I've shown that I'm ready to engage with data, but also respect and civility, even if I'm not getting it myself. I think that's something that our community needs to learn how to do better. In fact, our whole society needs to learn to do better. I also think this is why recreation, culture, neighborhood associations, things to get people out and having positive interactions with each other when safe to do so is so important and more important now than ever before. Thank you, Dylan. Chris? Yeah, thank you, Dan. Thanks, Dylan. Um, actually, as part of my platform, I'm going, going out of, of this crazy time that we're all in. And that's uh, to add to the, the mental wellness strategy. Uh, right after election, I'm hoping that a new council will hit the gates and start looking at the polarities that exist within our community. And much like Dylan said, how can we get people connected and together and having healthy, meaningful conversations and forming long lasting relationships? Again, I think that's an instrumental role to to any city council is how we can engage our community and have our community engage in the in the greater whole respectfully. So a mental wellness strategy for how we can bring people together is, is paramount to recovery. Thank you, Chris. And finally, Neil. Hello again, and thank you again. Well, for me, I totally agree with the two, two gentlemen, uh, two experienced gentlemen on our city and like to thank uh, their uh, 
like um, <clears throat> the services for for the city of Grand Prairie, like uh, like 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 what we do last year, we keep on uh, the doing the sports activities, mentally mental programs in Pomeroy Hotel and everything, connecting people like in sports. This is really the like the most important thing that to uh, to make the community get back on its feet again, get together mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. go out there and be together and you know express. And have, uh, everything that they they want to do to this lockdown and everything, I totally agree with Dylan and Chris with the programs that the, they said a while ago, and I, I I will do the same. Thank you, Neil. I'll just remind all the candidates to make sure your microphone is muted when you're not answering the questions. I cut. Next question to John Laners, Paul Robin. And Wendy Bosch. Wildcard. Wildcard. Oh, sorry. Wildcard. Who was that? That's me. You, you have to say your name. My name, is you. My name is Solomon Okifo. Okay, Solomon. Solomon would like to use his wildcard. I'm just marking that down. Okay, so the next question is, with regard to city taxes and rates, how would you show that you are accountable for the rate increases, which we see every year? John Laners, unless someone else wants to wildcard in first, sorry. No, okay, John Laners. Well, you know, I, I just spent 20 years on the, on the school board and the, and the initiative in the last four years was to ensure that uh, we were continually getting better and uh, proving that we were good stewards of uh, the tax dollars that we were given. And, and it's not hard if you, if you set high expectations as, a, as an organization and then uh, hold them accountable with measurable outcomes so that each department knows uh, you know, what's expected and, and make sure that we're all great stewards of, of the dollars that we're given. So I think that's important. And if, if everybody's doing as good as they can do, I have no problem looking people in the eye and saying, hey, we're get, you're getting great value for your dollar. Paul, you're next. Thank you very much. When it comes to taxes, in my opinion, pay for what you use when you use it. This includes giving the option to residents to up out of off-site recycle and garbage collection. That's what I think. If I am elect, that's what I will do. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you, Paul. And Wendy. Thank you. Good question. You know, the past 18 months, uh, living the realities of the pandemic, the oil and gas sector shut down and construction. I don't believe now is the time for any tax increases. I think we have to really look at the other side of it, which is economic development. We need to gain more industrial and commercial tax base to alleviate the residential tax basis. We need to be transparent. We need to be fiscally responsible and we need to hold the provincial and federal responsibilities um, in account. I think that city facilities have had some um, surplus. We can use that. Okay, thank you, Wendy. And Solomon, before you begin, I just want to double check because you called wildcard before I asked the question. Were you wanting to pull your wildcard for this question or was it for the previous one? Well, you know what? I can go ahead and use it for this one. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, so on the issue of uh, taxes, I, you know, vehemently am against uh, continuing to raise taxes. My argument is this, we have other municipalities in Alberta that don't have as much revenue base as we have in Grand Prairie, and their taxes are lower than ours. We about the highest, you know, uh, tax paying municipality in, in Alberta. Why is that so? I have taken courses in what they call Lean Six Sigma. It's about eliminating waste, and doing things to perfection. So we're going to critically look into our city. Where are the waste? 
We got to cut out the waste and make sure that things are done right the first time so that we don't continue to belabor citizens with taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon. And the order of the last speakers in this round, Melissa Erickson, Kevin McLean, Gladys Blackmore, and Sarvinder Singh. Question is, how would you lower the crime rate in Grand Prairie? Any wild card takers first? Not seeing anything. I'll use mine, Ejibola. Who's mine? Ejibola. Oh, Ejibola and Paul would like to use theirs, okay. So go ahead, Melissa. Start uh, with you. Thank you. Um, so uh, obviously this is a, a big thing for a lot of residents. Um, certainly collaborating with uh, the RCMP in Grand Prairie would be important. Um, I also had training when I was in college uh, on programs, uh, a program called Community Protection through Environmental Design, which was an RCMP initiative of creating spaces within urban centers to deter crime because a lot of crime uh, is crimes of opportunity. And I think a lot of people in Grand Prairie see that people rattling on door handles, walking down the street. Uh, so by using these initiatives that were already created by our partners, um, I think that would be very beneficial for the city here. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Kevin McLean. Thank you very much, Dan. I believe it's a very important issue. We do know in the city of Grand Prairie, we have some major issues. Um, at one time when I was on council, we were the biggest for theft of vehicles, and we had a lot of homicides one year. We have the RCMP, which I think is crucial, been here over 100 years. The crime doesn't happen just within the city. It happens within the county, within the MD Greenview. We need the RCMP to work with all regions to make it happen and not have our own force. I believe we need our, our RCMP, but we also have to look at towards the funding towards MD Greenview, where most of our workers go to work and see more formulas we can have to help with more RCMP and make it happen like White Court, Town of White Court does and other areas in Alberta. We need to reach out now and have a fair deal for us. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Gladys. Uh, there's an initiative in uh, certain sections of the province that is headed towards a uh, provincial police force and moving away from the RCMP model. And this is not something that I support. I believe that the RCMP model has provided very good policing in Grand Prairie for a very long time and will continue to provide very good policing. Um, again, uh, policing or crime in Grand Prairie tends to be crimes that are uh, opportunity. And I think that it's the individual, every one of us needs to take action to prevent uh, that, those individual opportunities from happening. Thank you, Gladys. Sarvinder. Sarvinder. Hello, uh, thanks for the question. So uh, about that, I would say uh, well, we ourselves, like as citizens, will have to be accountable for our stuff to have it locked away and uh, everything uh, put away and locked it. And after that, uh, the RCMP presence is already there, but uh, we can increase it a bit if we are needed. Uh, but there is uh, other options that we can look at, like. Uh, third party uh, security uh, companies or that, like the, the, the Prairie Mall does. They have their uh, patrol parties patrolling the uh, site, I don't know how many times a night or so. And uh, we can do that in uh, the city, uh, wherever needed, like mostly Muscassippi Park or wherever we see uh, there are more incidents and all that. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Hey, thank you, sir, Ender. Ejibola. Thank you very much. Um, a few weeks ago, I carried out a survey and 80% of the responses I got in regards to crime rate, 80% um, of the people said they were not safe in Grand Prairie. And why is this and what can we do? I think education um, is very important. How well are we transparent educating people about the effect this crime rate have on the city? Um, I've heard two people say these are opportunity crimes, but we need more employment opportunities for these people. We would need to know what age group are affected. Do they need counseling? What do we need to reduce it? And we need more empowerment of our police. How do we empower? How can we increase? 
and that's time and Ebola. Yeah, thank you. And Paul. Yeah, thank you very much. Some neighborhoods have seen their crime red sky rock over the last year. The air simply is doing a great job by keeping track of them and uploading the Grand Prairie crime map for the public. I think the next step will be to support the RCMP by providing them with the support they need to lower that rate and by educating our citizens on how to avoid being in a situation unsafe, like drug and alcohol usage, also increased over the past year. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you, Paul. And that concludes our second round of questions. Oh, I, I like this next question. It's gotten a lot of traction on Slido. Tammy Brown, Yad Minhas, and Solomon Akifo. Be prepared. The question is, how will you address the homeless situation in the city? Any wild cards going on? Wild once? card, Mike O'Connor. Okay. Tammy Brown, please begin. Thank you for the question. Um, homelessness is uh, uh, a sad issue within our community and not a happy thing to see in our streets for residents and for our just for people. It's a very sad thing to, to watch. Um, I am excited about our coordinated care campus that we'll be creating here in, in our town. Um, that hopefully it will relieve some of the pressures of the street people and actually get the support that they are able to need to be able to get off of the street. Um, I also believe as um, we feel the effects with the COVID and people are losing their jobs and more people are uh, coming to the street, that looking at um, low income housing uh, would be also an idea. Thank you, Tammy. Yad, you're next. Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, homeless, it's a big issue in Grand Prairie because we are very high compared to the rest of the province. And a lot of people come from outside and try to see Grand Prairie is probably a better place. But like the care center type, we start building it. And that would help. And the best thing we could do, affordable house, which is some we need more, which is federal government is trying to help to build more affordable houses. They'll cut down the cost for to get some people in. Also, what we need to do, the people, when we call the care center to fix them up so they can go back to work and then they can move into the affordable house. And that is uh, probably need more work to do it. And we need a very, thank you. Thank you, Yad. Solomon, you're next. Thank you. Uh, this is one of my signature uh, the same. Uh, the question is, why do we have such a high rate of homeless people in Grand Prairie? The answer is affordability. In cities where homes are not very much affordable, you see this, go to Vancouver and some of the city. So we have to have a strategy. Grand Prairie had uh, 10 years to end homelessness. Uh, I don't know exactly what has happened to that. We need to look at that document. Then the other thing is we need to start investing in low cost housing units. And we can give this to a third party to manage it. Red Day has have what they call Red Day Housing Authority. We need the, a, a Grand Prairie Housing Authority that a not-for-profit organization can help us manage and we'll be able to take care of this situation right away. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon. And finally, Mike O'Connor. Thank you. I think it's very important to deal with uh, homelessness is to get them secure housing, to deal with the trauma that they're dealing with and get their mental health back in, in place. And organizations that Northreach uh, can reach out and get their identity back so they can get into the uh, system to, for, 
AHS, and then they are able then mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. healthy communicating citizens. Uh, yeah, you need to mute. Uh, so yeah, I think it's very important that we all be part and encourage uh, helping the homeless get off the street and reduce our crime. Thank you, Mike. The next question will go to Dylan Bressy, Chris Thiessen, and Mike O'Connor. Mike used his wild card last time. This one has gotten a lot of traction given that uh, we're right on the heels of National Truth and Reconciliation Day. The question is, have you read and do you understand Treaty 8? What will you do this year to ensure that the city is doing their part and is advocating to the government appropriately to ensure that the traditional people of this land are thriving? Any wild card takers on this question? Seeing none, Dylan Bressy, please begin. Great, thank you. Yes, I have read Treaty 8. I've also read the entire Truth and Reconciliation Report. And I was proud to be the member of council that brought forward a motion when we were creating our strategic plan to add honoring our indigenous cultures into it. That being said, I think a lot more action is needed in our community and by the city and council, but the first step is understanding. Something else I've advocated for, and my understanding is it's gonna be happening, if not, I'll keep on hammering it, is for early in the term for our next council with our senior leadership to do a blanket exercise and have, uh, early start to learning about the impact of residential schools and colonialism. So we start having discussions with our indigenous community about how to further reconciliation here in Grand Prairie. It really is important. Thank you, Dylan. Chris. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dan. Yes, I have read uh, Treaty 8 as well as the calls to action on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, since coming on to council and even prior to, I've always been a bit ad, big advocate for the First Nations community uh, here in Grand Prairie. Um, I think there are some out of the box solutions that we can maybe start looking to as Grand Prairie is a very innovative community. Uh, one of the big things that I see is there's a barrier to language and culture amongst First Nations people themselves and how do they access that uh, within the city. I think if the city could advocate for better housing types and maybe even Cree language services, we might be able to take a step forward in the right direction towards truth and reconciliation. Okay, thank you, Chris. And finally, Mike. I had not read the Treaty 8, but I have just looked at a document as we spoke. And I think it's important that we understand the issues that they First Nations are going through. And uh, I met with Darlene Cardinal and uh, discussed with her about how we are affected by this uh, situation with uh, people on residential schools. And I think we need to be able to reach out and start reconciliation now and to bridge the gap and allow them to be part of our community and engage with uh, First Nations people. Thank you, Mike. Next on deck, Kevin O'Toole, Michelle Jasper, and Grant Berg. And the next question is, how will your vision of council leadership effectively address the needs of persons with disabilities in our community and in relation to the province of Alberta? Wild card, Gladys Blackmore. Okay, Gladys Blackmore will use her wild card. And Dylan Bressy, Anyone? please. And Dylan Bressy. Okay, thank you. We'll begin with Kevin O'Toole. Well, I, uh, you never know how healthy you're going to be. And uh, I joined the IDPD, which is the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, uh, a long time ago. I've worked with. Uh, a number of agencies in Grand Prairie to spread the word that we need to make sure accessibility is open to all people, whether it's a, a mother pushing a wheelchair, uh, a senior or a young person in a walker, or somebody that has a debilitating disease and is into a, uh, a, a, a 
some kind of mode of transportation, like a, uh, oh, geez, I've lost for words here, but uh, I'm very supportive. Hey, thank you, Kevin. Michelle, you're next. Yeah, I agree. Um, all across the city, I've noticed we have a lot of work to do to make thing, things a lot more accessible everywhere. I had a time where I was um, unable to get around easily, and I did notice we have a lot of a lot of stuff to work on: parking lots, um, even snow removal when it comes to bus stops and getting into places, and just yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Grant. Um, I actually learned a lot of this way back. I was uh, the chairman of the Art Gallery of Grand Prairie during its construction. And accessibility came up uh, just as much as the architecture did. Uh, the goal was to make art as accessible to everybody. So in my two locations of the two galleries that I've had, accessibility has been so key. Um, for wheelchairs and, and anybody with any other types of disabilities. One thing that I would suggest to the chamber um, for, for next time is that we do have closed captioning or somebody doing sign language for this debate so that we add that measure of accessibility. Um, I was also a participant in the chair affair and I learned a lot from that wheeling up from Muskocipi Park to 214 place. Um, and that's time, Grant. Sorry about that. And Gladys Blackmore. So my working history, I've had a, a long time, uh, 15 or so years working with people who have disabilities uh, through the United Way and through suicide prevention. And I'm a great advocate for our disabled busing system. I believe that uh, we need to make sure that we are continuously developing that and particularly paying attention to after our service. Um, we want our, uh, our, our, all of our population to be able to access the city. And for some people, they can only do it through disabled busing. Um, I really think that this is an important issue and it needs to go forward. Uh, we need to put it on the, on the forefront all of the time. Okay. Thank you, Gladys. And finally with Dylan. Great, thank you. This is an issue that's dear to my heart and I'm really proud of successfully bringing forward a number of initiatives for the city to act on to increase accessibility. But council isn't just elected to govern the city, we're also elected to be community leaders. So I put a lot of focus through the Accessibility Advisory Committee and inviting leaders to spend a day in a wheelchair to see what it's like. People I helped get in a wheelchair included grants and other candidates on this call, our MLA, senior city management, and also business and nonprofit leaders. And whether I'm reelected or not, I'll continue to really focus on encouraging people in our community to walk or wheel the mile in other people's shoes, whether it's accessibility issues, poverty issues, or other struggles, so that we can be a more compassionate, understanding community. Thank you, Dylan. Next up for the question, Ed Javola, Wendy Bosch, and Kevin McLean. And your question is, would you advocate the continued public financial support of large scale community tourism events, such as the Bear Creek Folk Festival? So would you advocate for events like the Bear Creek Folk Festival? Any wild card takers? Yeah, I'll, I'll wild card I, I will. Chris Thiessen. Chris Thiessen and who else? I was Tammy Brown. And Tammy Brown. Okay, uh, Edgebola, please begin. That's a great question. I guess given everything we've gone through for the past 19 months, I know everybody is yearning to be outside, to socialize, to connect, to relate, to engage. I would definitely say yes. Um, supporting public um, um, festivals like that. However, we need to take into consideration um, the restrictions, um, um, making sure that there is that mandated um, safety 
for us to do so. So yes, I would definitely support something like that. I mean, we've got kids that need to be outside to learn more about the environment, to learn more about different cultures, about different things, to get educated. This is the way for them to get educated, being outside and learn. Hey, thank you, Edubola. So I just want to make it clear this question was, would you advocate the continued public financial support of these large scale tourism events? And Wendy Bosch, you're next. Hi. This is kind of my wheelhouse since I do events for the Downtown Association. Um, I would support community events such as this and large events. It brings tourism to our community. It brings economic positive impacts to our community. So our hotels, our hospitality, our restaurants, uh, a positive view for our city. It brings the factor of health and wellness to our community. If people feel there is a positive quality of life in their community, then they, they feel better, especially in times like this. And I think it's necessary to have diversity in our uh, festivals or community. Hey, thank you, Wendy. Kevin McLean. Thank you, Dan. And my answer to this is yes, yes, yes. Um, where do we live? Northern Alberta. Um, we're not in Edmonton or Calgary where there's a lot of cultural and different events and diversity. We have lots of diversity here, but we don't have enough events. And yes, what about the stampede as well? We got to keep that up, even though it's out in the county, it started within the city. The folk festival, there used to be the uh, East Coast Garden Party. I believe there's other events we can have. Could be country comeback, where it used to be and it's gone. Could be rock and roll. Could be a heritage festival. Could be a cultural festival. We need to do this because where we live and we got to get through COVID and we must, must do this for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And out of the two wild cards, I'm gonna start with Tammy Brown. Thank you. Um, this question is actually kind of fun for me. I uh, have sat on the uh, pursuit of excellence for the city of Grand Prairie for the past nine years, which uh, ended here last year. Now I sit on the Grand Prairie Community Advisory Committee. And in these committees, we were always very big supporters of uh, festivals and sporting events in our area. Um, they are a great revenue for our Grand Prairie area, for our businesses and hotels and restaurants. There are great revenue for our clubs at that time when they when they're able to do these festivals and stuff. For us as a city to be able to, to support them is a great thing. Even our country rodeo that's going on this Halloween weekend is supported by us and is through all television and radio broadcasts you know, through and so in Canada. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tammy. And finally, Chris Thiessen, the last word. Hey, thanks, Dan. Um as a former music promoter myself and festival festival creator i uh i'm a bit jealous by this fund that we have uh, available to anyone who wants to create a large-scale tourism event in our community um recently council scaled it back by about half so down to a hundred thousand dollars and that doesn't encourage more events to come out of the woodworks it just encourages a bigger fight over a smaller pot so not only would i advocate for continued support from the city of grand prairie for large-scale community events but i would also advocate that we increase the amount of funding available so that we can disperse out to more to more organizations so that we can help the artists, the vendors, and the other people who are impacted by those events in our community. Thank you, Chris. Next question goes to Gerald Hafner, Paul Robin, and Sarvinder Singh. The question is, as the city is a government, the capital and operation budget are significantly different than a business. How are you prepared to handle the budgets in areas within the city that do not recover their costs, such as recreation centers? Any wild cards? I'll go in down as well, Kevin McLean. Kevin McLean, thank you. Hey, Gerald, if you can start. Well, that's a pretty loaded question for me since I'm, uh, you know, fairly new at this, right? So uh, to come in and say, uh, to give you guys a straight answer, it, it, that's a tough one for me because that's new. Um, 
my goal, obviously, going to this is to, is is to get on council and learn things like this, and uh, and be a, and I'm passionate about it, but I can't give a straight answer on that uh, to be truthful and and be right about it. So uh, I will, you know, begrudgingly pass on this question, but I, I just know that you guys that are in there, that are experienced, uh, know what's going on, and that's that's where you have to come in and learn from that is what, what these guys that have been in here are already doing this. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. Yeah. Paul. Thank you very much. What? When I become a counselor, I will go through it with my colleague counselor. I will take a time to see how the process has been made. We will go around all that, put every evidence in place, and see how we can go about it to reduce the capital price. And uh, that's exactly what I think I will do. And uh, my colleague will agree with me. Uh, being a new counselor, exactly, I can't do anything without consulting my colleagues. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. And Sarvinder. Hello, hi. Uh, my views on that would be, uh, I think uh, I'm a business owner myself. So if one sector, like if it's not, like we're, as a city, we're not a business. So we should be thinking more about people and uh, for the recreational, uh, recreational facilities, even if they're going into loss, people are still like, it should be affordable for people to go in there and uh, have fun and uh, relax and all that. So I wouldn't be worried too much about it, but I would, uh, probably be looking at uh, the other options that we have to generate that uh, revenue because uh, if uh, that sector goes in loss, I wouldn't be that much worried about it. Like we should have to look at something else. And yeah, we have to keep it affordable for our uh, citizens. Thank you, Sarvinder. Finally, Kevin McLean. Thank you very much, Dan. This is a very important issue to my heart. I've lived in the city for over 30 years. Capital, yes, you have to use capital to build the fields, operational to run the fields and maintain them. We need it unbelievable now in our city. Our growth is going to be substantial. We've had, when I moved here in 1990, we were 27,000 people. We are 70 now. We're looking within 20, 25 years of doubling, of going over 120,000, 130,000 people. Our fields have been the same since I moved here in the soccer, the rugby, the cricket fields playing in the storm sewer area. We need a total revamp of how we're doing business where our recreational team sport helps mental stability and brings the love back in the community that you can't even express here on this debate. I am all for this and we need to put capital in it now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. And the final round of questions go to John Laners. Melissa Erickson, Neil Tuazan, and Gladys Blackmore. How will you, as a new councillor, bridge the disconnect between the public and the city administration? From road repair, snow removal, uh, we feel we are not heard or communicated to. Example, the Stonebridge Hotel purchase. So how would you bridge the communication or the disconnect? Any other uh, candidates want to chime in on that one? Seeing none, let's begin with John Laners. Oh, uh, well, I always get to be first, so I can't say ditto to any of this stuff here. So, um, yeah, you know, obviously I, I spent a lot of time with infrastructure. I've been a, an engineer for 30 years and doing development uh, consistently uh, throughout and dealt with lots of municipalities. With regards to the stone bridge, well, you know, I've, in my past, in my life, I've, I've done lots of consultations and worked with people trying to do subdivisions, redevelopments, and I, I, I really didn't feel that there was the proper engagement. I didn't feel like there was, uh, the, you know, the right process necessarily for all this that seemed kind of secretive, so it didn't really pass the tummy test. So I think there definitely needs to be some improvement in how we do that process. An emergency on the city's part doesn't mean that, you know, everything has to kind of go, uh, kind of be circ circumvented, and, and I thought it didn't feel well. Thank you, John. Melissa, you're up. Uh, thank you. So uh, I think there needs to be some uh, brainstorming on ways to make the information more accessible to the people in the city. Um, I, for one, am uh, 
commonly on social media and I find that I'm missing information about how decisions are made. And I think the city needs to do more than just the bare minimum of posting notices uh, for things like the Stonebridge for the community. They should be actively engaging with the people um, going out of their way to bring people in to have these discussions. Um, so bridging that gap means maybe more widespread social media campaign and then brainstorming uh, ways to bring that information more accessible to everybody who may not have computers and those types of things. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Neil? Yeah, thank you. Well, bridging the gap between the people and, and, and the administration. For me, the only thing is the, the, the thing that we need to do is, is public service. I mean, real public service. I mean, what, what are the real, the, the real people needs? So to, to bridge that, we just need to do the, 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 prop, uh, the things that uh, the, the people really want uh, to uh, do uh, things to get done. Like for example, in the infrastructure, like doing this, uh, like simple potholes, pothole, like fixing it at the same spot at the same time every single year. And when it comes to Stone Bridge, uh, I, I know that the, the city is doing their uh, quick decision on this, but maybe, um, maybe a further more uh, decision and study will do. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Neil. And finally, Gladys. I have to agree that I that the communication that's been taking place between council, city administration, and the general public has been uh, difficult. And I think that that's the case for governments across Canada, not just this one, but municipalities, uh, the federal government, the provincial government. During COVID, it seems like we have lost the ability to communicate. Um, I didn't feel that the Stone Bridge uh, really was in the public eye before it became an absolute decision. And I was disappointed in that. And I feel that the city uh, websites and social media are too large and too complicated. And so you know, you're looking in one place and suddenly you're bumped back to another place and you don't know how you got there. Uh, I think there's a lot of work that can be done that way. Thank you, Gladys. And this looks like it'll be the last time I'm going to be going through this uh, this group of council candidates. So I'm going to draw four at a time just to try to speed things up because I only have about 15 minutes. Next question goes to Grant Berg, Michael Connor, Dylan Bressy, and Gladys Blackmore. And the question is, what will you do to build intermunicipal relationships and work collaboratively with your municipal neighbors? What is your knowledge regarding current intermunicipal initiatives and projects? And what do you see as opportunities? Well, I think to date, um, when we look at the tri-municipal park uh, that was supposed to go south of the city, uh, that, that fell apart. Maybe somebody later can address why. But Bottom line is communication and mutual interest. Um, I like to think that I know a number of people on that are running for county council. They're people that I know, that I trust. I don't have any animosity towards any of them. Uh, there's, so, so there's opportunity there just simply through communication, positive communication. Yes, in some ways we're competitors. We want the, the residents, we want the industrial parks, but at the same time, we have to look at the regional approach and bottom line, communication. Thank you, Grant. Mike O'Connor. Thank you. Uh, this is a very critical issue moving forward for our community. We need to be able to reach out and engage with government, with the chambers, with city, uh, count, county councils, MD councils, and talk about what's the most important issues that are moving forward so that we can grow our region. And I think it's important that relationship uh, be there and we need to be able to cooperate with each one of the, these organizations and we need to build on a positive message that we need to market to the whole region, not just Grand Prairie. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Dylan Bressy. Well, let's be honest, every candidate, every election says we need to prioritize this relationship and fix it and it hasn't been successful in the past, but there's two unique opportunities this next term. 
One is each council is going to have about a 50% or more turnover, so new voices at the table. And the other is by April, we'll have a provincially mandated cost sharing agreement in place. So talking about money for existing services will be completely off the table for the rest of the term. And hopefully when money is not part of the conversation, we can do a, it's easier to roll up our sleeves and talk about how we can actually work together. This needs to be prioritized. I think opportunities include industrial traction, renewable energy generation like geothermal, and new recreation facilities. So I hope that I get to be a part of this because it truly is important and there's unique opportunities. Thank you, Dylan. And Gladys Blackmore. Northern Alberta has only about 10% of the population of the province. And we have somewhere around 30 to 35% of the, of the income uh, that we uh, you know, use to support programs across the province. And we can't, uh, we can't uh, take advantage of that if we are not getting along with our regional municipal neighbors. And so I think it's really important that we stay united to that common goal of sending messages from Northern Alberta to the province. Um, we can do this by supporting what our regional neighbors want rather than expecting that they're gonna support us in our needs. We need to be a good neighbor and uh, a good friend to our regional municipalities. Thank you all for those answers. Those are great answers. That was an important question. An extra 10 points for each of you, mainly because the points don't mean anything. Next round of questions go to Wendy Bosch, Neil Tuazan, Ejibola Atet, Adedo Konbo Taiwo, and Chris Thiessen. And the question is, Grand Prairie has been, di been discussing a new performing arts center for over 10 years. What are you going to do to make this a reality? Any wild cards? Yeah, wild card Grant Berg. Grant Berg. Okay, Wendy Bosch, begin. Well, I've had a lot of discussions uh, working in the core with our municipality, with their city councilors and administration in this regard. There is talk about exactly where the right location it is. Um, is it Montrose site? Is it with the Bonnet Center? Or is it somewhere else? It is necessary in this community. We need it, for instance, to attract professionals to the area. We have a um, struggling labor crisis. And that is one um, aspect to bring people to, the, to our city. Uh, arts is important to people. Um, I think we need to look at dollars and cents and where the best location is and bring... Um, oh. Sorry, time's up, Wendy. Next answer from Neil to Go ahead. Well, I totally agree too that for me, this uh, center that uh, we're talking about this, for me is a perfect, uh, we should uh, like uh, choose the perfect location for this and mm -hmm. what are it? Are we going to offer with this with this uh, theater if we're going to build this? So we need a new maybe new ideas and uh, perspective on this matter. So I rather talk about like uh, what are the different things that we can we can offer from uh, other people so that we can attract uh, tourists here in, in Grand Prairie. Thank you, Neil. Ejibola. Thank you. So um, I'm going to start this way. Aside from the location that Wendy mentioned and aside from what are we offering that Neil said, I would like to look at what is the cost? What will be the cost on the city's budget? How are we using the ones that we have right now? And do we have a report of the ones we're using right now and how effective and efficient are we using it? Um, it can be done right on budget and using the best contractors, but let's have also open bidding and ensure that the best contractor is being used. I'm welcome to more ideas. I'm new <laughs> if I get on the on 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 on, on the seat on the city council, but these are my opinion. I believe that we should look at the cost. Okay, thank you, Ajibola. Chris. 
Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, no, uh, Performing Arts Centre is uh, pretty pivotal towards the growth of any mature city. And I don't think we're far off, but some of the things that a council has to weigh, first and foremost, is, is the cost. Uh, recent estimates that uh, council received was that the cost to do a very, really nice Performing Arts Centre uh, would be about $90 million, and that's in today's costs. Um, I think we may have learned the lessons of the past from the East Link Center where we saw waiting on, on something for a long time can sometimes double that cost and affect our, our overall budget as well as our borrowing capacity. So for now, I would, I would urge caution. Uh, we have the JP2 Theater, the Little Theater, the Douglas J. Cardinal, and let's find a way. Thanks, Chris. Grant. Yeah, about, uh, well, it was actually February 2010, the city commissioned what was called a cultural master plan. And what it was, was a roadmap into the future for cultural development within the city. And it's kind of been shelved for the last few years. So I'm glad that this question came up. Uh, so in the broader scope, what are we doing to fulfill the cultural master plan? And how are we gonna get back on track or at least stay on that map? So it's just not another government uh, report that was shelved. So I would like to see one, but not not immediately, not even in the midterm, but possibly 10, 12 years down the road, what something like the East Link Center is paid for. I think it's a natural part of our growth to attract professionals. And we're a winter city. So the more entertainment we can bring in the winter, the better we are off. Thank you, Grant. Next question goes to Sarvinder Singh, Solomon Akifo, Paul Robin, and Tammy Brown. And the question is, how will you support the countless nonprofit and volunteer organizations operating in Grand Prairie that provide essential services to the population at no cost to the city? Any wild cards before we begin? Uh, wild card, Melissa Erickson. Thank you, Melissa. Sir Binder, you can begin. Uh, hi, yeah, about that, uh, I would uh, reach out to the to the communities who are helping out uh, uh, Grand Prairie with uh, uh, their services and see what they need or uh, if there are uh, uh, any requirements for funding or any kind of help they would uh, need from the city uh, within the budget and all that. And uh, mm, yeah, that's about it. Like, I, I don't have much to say on it. Thank you, Sir Binder. Solomon. Thank you. As uh, a graduate of uh, public administration, I have learned the usefulness of what we call the public private partnership and non for profit organization are valuable resources in the community. There are things that non for profit can do well, well better than the city can do it in terms of cost, in terms of uh, effectiveness and efficiency. And so we need non for profit organization. In terms of saying we cannot support them with money, maybe that's possible. If it's possible, the only thing I would say do is let the city have to encourage them, popularize their program and on, uh, I mean, on the media that the city uses, tell the community how impactive these people are and you will see private individuals supporting this organization to help them. Thank you, Solomon. Paul, you're next. Thank you very much. To improve this community, volunteer service have a big role to play. I myself as coordinator of a, a free tax program for the past five years, I know more about that. A lot of people, especially on this crisis time, are very passing a hard time there without having money in their pocket and they are looking how to like survive in this time. I think the city should try to find a way how we can support nonprofit organization in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. And Tammy Brown to finish. Thank you. Our nonprofits within our community are a, a huge um, asset and we support a lot of our mental um, and health and um, people with complicated needs. And we need to make sure that we are continuing to ad address them and support these, these um, programs. 
um, to support our other programs within our community, um, um, possibly our ski hill and all those things. Those are also very important as they bring um, revenue to our community and uh, community um, growth and spirit. And these things are very important for us to be a city so that we can be a friendly city and be known as that, as, as a community oriented and, and people who are loving each other. Thank you, Tammy. So in recognition of the time, we're getting really close. I am now going to cancel any other wild cards. If you have not used it, sorry about that. We have to stay on track. Next question goes to Kevin McLean, Yad Minhas, Kevin O'Toole, and John Laners. What is the one thing you will advocate for to help GP become more green? Kevin McLean. Thank you, Dan. I think we have to look at that as a, a broad prospect with more green is to look at the federal and provincial government. And we know the way the federal government is looking at it right now, they want that. And so we have to do through Federation of Canadian Municipalities, try to find whatever grant monies we can get through the federal government and then with the provincial government. But we have to go through provincial first because they passed a bill that we can't get any monies from the federal unless we talk to them first, which I think was not the best. But that's what we have to do. We have to find out where the money is and go to these conferences because that's how we will find out and learn to bring some extra money in our community. If we do not do that, it's tough to do it. We have to follow the federal lead and the provincial. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Yad? Yeah, like Kevin said, you know, federal governments really want to be green and we are Alberta and we don't believe that much into that side but we have to do something like we've got to use more electrical buses and also try to cut down a, somebody talked earlier we should have those uh, battery charges for the grant pay do because of our weather is so cold it's probably be going to take time to do that but also we need more greenery we need to grow more trees around which is we already doing started which is before was not there then also to use the base to do something and utilize like to make the diesel fuel or some other stuff with that. That would uh, benefit, eventually we're gonna be having to cut down the carbon cost, carbon gas out, thanks. Thank you, uh, Kevin O'Toole. Thank you very much. Uh, I know as a partner in, uh, or shareholder in Aquaterra, Aquaterra has, uh, mind, I guess you could call it, uh, the, the waste water or waste uh, location out there, and they get to uh, use the fuel that's uh, uh, harvested in the, into reducing uh, the cost of the operation. I would be a strong opponent of uh, looking at uh, geothermal we have reports that uh, geothermal is relatively good in this area, and I would like to see how we can generate power. And uh... time's up, Kevin. Sorry about that. And John Laners. Yeah, as um, as a land developer for you know working with land developer for a while, I think one idea that might be helpful to them is is if we make application to turn uh, the Bear Creek Reservoir into a into an environmental stormwater management pond. And so that will free up areas in development so that they can use, uh, create larger green spaces. And while you're at it, uh, why not create a micro generator power station up our dam by drilling a hole, uh, drilling a pipe up the side and using that revenue from power to uh, fund nonprofits in our community. Okay, thank you, John. So I do have three names left. In the interest of fairness, I am going to call one last question. Michelle Jasper, Gerald Hafner, and Melissa Erickson. Um, our homeless shelter is one of the most underfunded shelters in Alberta. What strategy would you use for advocating for increased resources from the provincial government? For the homeless oh. shelter. <laughs> Michelle Jasper. Yep. Um, yeah, I feel we do have a, an issue here in Grand Prairie with mental health and which has to do with, with and then addiction and crime. And so far it all plays hand in hand. I just think we, 
we need to be huge advocates to put mental health first. Um, and yeah, I, I, I believe in Grand Prairie, we should have mental health or somebody available 24 seven for mental health. Um, I think it just all, I think it'll trickle up and help if we can start there. Thank you, Michelle. Gerald? Uh, I was gonna answer earlier, I was gonna be a wild card a little earlier because uh, homelessness, well, I was one of those guys back in the day. I, I was that guy. And uh, for about just about a couple of years, I lived in the streets. And uh, so to be on that side of it and to come where I've come to, I, I know there's hope for all that. And, and we have to be advocates for these guys. Do they all wanna be helped? We know, we know that's not true, but there's 99% of them wanna be helped. And so we have to find a way to be there for these guys and, and, and make it happen for these guys. I'm so passionate about that. I meant to do a wild card earlier on that one and I, and I dropped the ball on it, but uh, absolutely. And that just echoes what Michelle's saying basically. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Gerald. Thank you, Gerald. Yeah. And finally, Melissa. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I do agree with my uh, fellow candidates here. Um, I, I think it's very important um, that we address these mental health issues. Uh, I believe Grand Prairie is the fifth largest city in Alberta. Uh, so, you know, we have a, a, an issue with uh, the unhoused individuals here. Um, but I think collaborating with the nonprofit organizations that assist these folks uh, and lobbying the provincial government is going to be very key. So if that means um, consulting with these organizations and these individuals and uh, working together on campaigns uh, for presenting to the provincial government is going to be very important. Um, for all of us to be involved in, uh, whether or not we're on city council. Um, so I think that's something that's going to be very important going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you for um, all the candidates for your responses this evening. Um, it's time for closing remarks. You can either summarize your campaign or you can further um, extend on any responses from any of the questions tonight or just talk a little bit about, her, about yourself and let people know who you are. This order was done by random draw. I'm gonna do the same system and I'll call you four at a time. We'll start with Gerald Hafner, Neil Tuazan, Kevin O'Toole, and then John Laners. Okay, well, that wasn't fair, was it? Um, anyway, <laughs> um, you know, I'm one of the new guys here. And uh, when I decided to come on board and run for council, I was passionate about Grand Prairie and I'm passionate about Grand Prairie. I've been a citizen here for 20 years, 22 years, and back and forth my whole life here. Uh, I wanted to be a voice. You know what? All of us here that are talking right now, we were all new trying to go into, you know, politics at one point of our life. You guys were all been there. This is my first kick at the can. And it's because I am passionate about our city. Uh, homelessness is huge with me. Uh, the women's shelters are huge with me, uh, and, and that's where I'm going to put my focus is in that. Uh, as I learn more and as I go ahead with this, uh, um, I know I'll be, a, I'll be a voice for Grand Prairie. I, I, as, I've, as I've spoken to everybody, when I decide to vote on something, if I'm elected into council, you have to talk to Grand Prairie first. As Gladys said back a little while ago about the old Trump building, Trump building. Sorry, Gerald, time is up. Thank you very much. Neil, your closing statement. Yeah, again, good evening to everyone. As a volunteer since I was 15 years old, the only thing that for me doing in the council is not really a job for me, it's a passion. It's really a passion, me, a passion for me to serve the people. I like to meet people. I, I like, to, like to talk to them, how are they doing? I really love to serve the people. As a president of the nonprofit organization of the Philippine Association of Grand Prairie Area, which I was doing since almost three years now. I just want to uh, let the, the people of Grand Prairie know that I want you to be, I want me to be your voice in the city council. As a simple, simple person I am, I'm not a business owner. I'm just a simple guy like you. I'm a community leader. I'm not a politician. Thank you, Neil. Kevin O'Toole. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I've lived here uh, since 1965. I moved here when I was five. I've got uh, a wife married 41 years and I've got three children and 10 grandchildren. 
I truly believe in this community. I have spent uh, the last 11 years uh, serving on council. I, I, I take it as a big, important job, one that I'm very proud of. And with that, um, I wanna make sure that people can go out onto the street, go for a walk and be safe. I want them to be able to enjoy sports. I want them to get a good ed education. We have the GPRC here and uh, you know, that's a jewel that I'm very, very proud of. We've got an airplane. If you wanna get out of Grand Prairie, we've got an airplane uh, airport here that you can travel uh, within a few hours, you can be in another country. Thank you for your remarks, Kevin. John Laners. Yeah, thank you. I guess um, I've, I've lived in this town since I was in diapers and I suspect I'll be here until I'm back in diapers. Um, many of you know me, I'm making a living as an engineer, but I think, um, I think I've made a life out of giving back to the community. And my dad always said, it's important to give back more than you give. And, and, and I believe that too. And, and I guess for the past 20 years, I've been on the public school board, uh, trustee, uh, creating great citizens and, and good neighbors for all of us. And now I want to continue uh, making a, a grand city. So people ask me what I believe, and I, I believe we need to get uh, value for our taxes. We need to ensure that all people in the organization are excited about their roles and they understand the high expectations we have for them and ourselves and, and that uh, they and us are all held accountable to the cities of Grand Prairie to be good stewards of, of, their, of your money. And I, I believe the community and, and getting together is important and events that bring people together is good for our well-being. And I believe that we live in the city of opportunity. And then... Sorry, time's up, John. Thank you. The next four on deck, Solomon Okifo, Sarvinder Singh, Wendy Bosch, and Kevin McLean. For your closing statements. Go ahead, Solomon. Thank you very much. Hello, Grand Perry. You've seen me, you've heard about me. Uh, I want to let you know that I'm prepared to serve. For the past two years, I've invested over $10,000 on myself to train in public administration. That was to enable me to understand how to know the needs of the community and effectively craft policies to meet those needs. I am not a typical politician. I don't sit on, on the fence on issues. If you like the truth, you're gonna like me. If you hate the truth, you're gonna hate me. I wanna let you know, I am, want to build a friendly, I mean a family friendly community with a culture of love and unity, a crime free society, strong economy, affordable and highly integrated. You know, like I said, in Nigeria, they will say shine your eyes. It means look at people very well. Don't vote for people who are there to protect their business, who are representing interest group. Vote for genuine people like Solomon. Thanks, Solomon. Sarvinder. Hi, yeah, something about myself. Uh, I came to Grand Prairie about seven years ago and I started at a minimum wage and uh, I've struggled a lot. And uh, through uh, these seven years, I've been through different jobs, uh, different fields and all that experience. And I was able to save up some money and then, uh, yeah, started my own business. And then now it was, I thought it was about time to give back to the community. And uh, there's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, uh, like my top list was uh, uh, our transit. And uh, uh, the first of all was the heated bus shelters that like I used to drive a bus. And uh, I felt really bad people waiting outside uh, uh, in the cold uh, to get on a bus at uh, that. And then uh, all over, I just want a grand to be a, safer, healthier, and sustainable uh, community and city. And whatever I could uh, give that uh, to make it happen, yeah, I would do that. Thank you. Thank you, Sarvinder. Wendy? First of all, I'd like to thank the chamber for this forum. It is, uh, it has been enlightening and actually quite fun. I made the decision to run for city council because I see such potential in Grand Prairie. I am business focused um, because I believe that a vibrant economy translates to a vibrant community. We need our businesses to stay open. We need kids and activities. We need our people to be working and we need to have a safe community. 
Our region is the economic driver for the province, which will translate to economic growth and a vibrant community. Having a strong community also results in supporting our social and not-for-profit sectors. I work as the executive director for the Grand Prairie Downtown Association. So I'm well-versed in advocating for my core and hopefully my city. Um, and thank you, Wendy. The next four I've drawn are Gladys Blackmore, Michelle Jasper, Chris Thiessen, and Dylan Bressy. I think you're missing me, Dan. Oh, sorry. That's okay. I did miss Kevin McLean. Sorry. Please, Kevin. Thank you, Dan. I'm very proud to call the city Grand Prairie home for the last 31 years. We have grown to become a city that is very diverse and young. People from around Canada and the world have moved here for work and to raise their families. A strong city is a diverse city. My experience on two previous councils, committees, and boards has helped in my development. Thank you, Helen Rice, Lauren Radburn, Dwight Logan, Dan Wong, Bill Given, and many more. You'll see over the next three weeks my hope for change with policy and procedures in the city. We need to move forward together after COVID and this bad economy are behind us. We as a community, province, and country will win. Vote McLean, McLean with the mustache. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So I did announce the next four, Gladys Blackmore, Michelle Jasper, Chris Thiessen, and Dylan Bressy. Get them on the screen and begin with Gladys. Well, thank you everyone who's out there listening to us tonight and watching us on, uh, on the screen. Uh, we appreciate the time that you've put in. You know, I believe in Grand Prairie. This is, this is our home. This is your home and mine. And we want this city to be the best home that we can build while staying in budget. We want drivable streets. We want great activities for our kids. Uh, we want affordable services. And we want a council to defend our interests to both the province and to the feds. And to accomplish this, we need a council that is uh, experienced, that is resourceful, and that is capable. I'm experienced. I've been on council for nine years in the past and I had a good track record. Um, I'm resourceful. I have a business degree and I've spent a lot of time in management um, and I've delivered some pretty big projects on uh, shoestring budgets and I'm capable. I can bring people together. I can read a balance sheet and I know when someone is feeding me a line of malarkey. So on October 18th. Thanks Gladys. Michelle Jasper, you're up. Hi, I just want to say thank you for taking your time to join us tonight. Um, I would just like to, I, sorry. <laughs> um, I've lived in Grand Prairie for just over 40 years. I uh, raised four kids here and we actually recently just welcomed our first grandchild. Um, yeah, and I've also had a hand in helping to raise several other kids from around here. Um, I just want to help bring the community closer together so people feel safe and want to stay and raise their families here and maybe and retire and have lots to do. But yeah, vote for Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Chris Thiessen. Well, thanks, Dan, and to all the members who are taking part here today. It's uh, great to see such an outpouring of community leadership and togetherness. Um, for the amount of people that care about this community. And if you know me, you probably already know that I'm a force for positivity. I have a great love for this community and a compassionate heart for all people in general. And I'm a big hugger. Uh, I'm a man of character and, and I am a character, an out of the box thinker, a problem solver, a team player, uh, and an active supporter for good causes. I'm respectful, I speak my truth, and I love engaging in meaningful conversation. I've given, I've learned, and done so much as a member of your city council this past two terms, uh, and I still know that there's much more I can do today to continue our path towards sustainability through community design, to mentor and assist the new leaders and mayor of our community, and to co-create the highest vision of our city as the best version of ourselves. On October 18th, I hope you're as inspired as I am to make a change. Thank you, Chris. 
Dylan Brissy. Great. Well, thanks for being here tonight. And the thing I want to say about me is what you see is what you get. I'm the only candidate with a published and detailed plot and full de platform. I've published a financial campaign disclosure. And I'm also somebody who as a city councillor proved that the things I keep on, I do to campaign, I keep on doing to be in touch with you when I'm on council. As a councillor, I stayed active on social media. I wrote about every major council decision. I hosted community roundtables so that residents could hear not just from me, but also from one another. I had coffee with hundreds of people who had questions, comments, or ideas. And I made sure to get out of my echo chamber by knocking on doors to talk to random everyday people. So if you want somebody with a proven track record of working hard to be transparent, stay, stay engaged and hear from you, then please vote for Dylan Bressy. Thank you, Dylan. Next on deck, Melissa Erickson, Tammy Brown, Mike O'Connor and Grant Berg. Melissa, you can begin when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Dan, and thank you to everybody else who's participating tonight. Uh, just a bit about me. I grew up not too far from Grand Prairie in Manning, Alberta, uh, but I lived quite a few places from BC to Ontario and even overseas. Um, but just about four years ago, I made the decision to come to Grand Prairie to live here, uh, to, to settle down, to start a business. Um, as a lawyer, I zealously advocate for my clients. And as a city councillor, I would do the same for the residents of Grand Prairie. Uh, things that I'm really passionate about include consultation with the residents um, and accessibility, uh, not only physical, but uh, information wise as well, making sure that we can make uh, have Grand Prairie as inclusive as possible uh, regarding decisions that are made with city council. Um, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Tammy Brown. Tammy, we, we need your video and I think you're still on mute. Sorry, everyone, I keep forgetting to unmute. Thank you. And I've had a wonderful evening with you all. As your city councillor, I believe in serving our community and making Grand Prairie our proud home. I will do this by being grounded, working hard, and being committed to you, the residents of Grand Prairie. I want to work for you and your family for growth, sustainability, and for an economic and responsible city for continued prosperity. I will fight for the hardworking families of Grand Prairie for controlled and managed spending of the city's budget and to control capital overspending. I will encourage economic growth in our area, creating jobs and opportunities. I will work with our city councillors for positive partnerships with other municipalities, the province, and the federal government. I will strive for a friendly, comfortable, safe place for our residents to preserve the best of small town life in the city and embrace creative, positive thinking. I believe in Grand Prairie's future and upon our community strength and making a life that all city residents want to achieve together. And for more information on me, you can go to my website, brown2021.ca. And thank you for the opportunity and vote Tammy Brown. Thank you, Tammy. Next up, Michael Connor. Thank you, everyone. Great forum. Uh, my board experience positions me well to represent all residents. My board governance training will aid me in focusing on the goals of the city. I now have the time, the passion, and the energy, and the determination to the, be the best city councillor. My future focus and work ethic will drive us forward uh, in a growing, innovative economy and a safer community where businesses and families will move and put down roots just like I did. Uh, I have invested time in this community, especially in the last, last nine months. I have been attending Zoom City Council and subcommittee meetings since January, and I have treated this as a full-time job. Hard work is only the beginning. I will give all my effort to represent all citizens of Grand Prairie with an open mind, open ear, and a collaborating spirit. No one will outwork me. I'm at your service on October 18th. Vote for Michael Connor because we are better together. Thank you, Mike. And finally, Grant Berg. Well, it's ironic that we've been here two hours and it's a Chamber of Commerce event. We haven't talked about small business yet. I am a small business owner. I am a member of the Chamber of Commerce and was actually honored earlier this year to be a finalist for an Alberta Business Award of Distinction. Um, 
I also sit on the downtown association board. I'm passionate about small business. So rather than talking about me, I invite you to go to my website, grantberg.ca. I want to take just this rest of my time to talk about small businesses, how they're, they build community, mom and pop stores. From there, they evolve into the box stores, our restaurant change. But we also see we have a critical mass and those people come back. And so what I want to see over the next four to eight years is how we can nurture small business so that it will add employment, tourism, culture, and quality of life to Grand Prairie. So that's one of the important things to me that hasn't been addressed or asked over the past two hours. Again, revolves around small business. Thank you, Grant. And our final three councillor candidates, Ejibola, Adelkombo Taiwo, Yad Menhaz, and Paul Robin. Ejibola, when you're ready. So I've lived in Canada for 16 years and out of which I've been in Grand Prairie for seven. I'm very passionate about the city. I love the energy that comes with it because Grand Prairie is a very innovative city. As such, my desire for the city is to see a safer place for our children, the seniors and everybody to live in, a place where we can attract the best talent, a city where our youth and our students can be retained after college, where they can where they can be proud to live, work, and raise a family. Um, a place where we can attract the best investment, where we can dominate when, when, when it comes to innovation, where government initiatives can be implemented. A Grand Prairie where we can be proud of now and in the future. To get to know more about me, visit my website, www.ejibola.com, and come October 18, vote for Ejibola so I can be a voice at the table. I love diversity. I would love for us to. Thank you, Ejibola. Yad Minhas, you're next. I don't, Dan. I really thankful for the Chamber of Commerce. They put it up this thing and also all the thing there. I've been involved in the Chamber, I don't know how many years, about 10 or 12 years in the room. Uh, I came here, Grand Prix 74, but working in the power side in the bush with the Crocker and Gamble days. Hard work pays off and the time and comes and that I have loved this community and uh, this culture in Grand Prairie with that we had growth and we had become a business person uh, with our family. And I'm family oriented person and I got uh, three grandchildren and my son is a father, he's in Grand Prairie, which is I'm proud of it. And I'd like to give something to back to community and the next generation what I earned from this community 46 year and I'm married 41 years. So we are very family oriented family and I love to be Grand Prairie and I like to people ask if they can vote me again and elect me and want to give some back to the next generation. Thank you, Yad. And last but not least, Nyevital Paul Robin. Thank you very much. I am Paul Rovid. I have been in Grand Prairie for the past seven years. My happiness and pleasure come from helping people achieve their goal, feel good, and feel very relatable in the community. I want to run as a counselor because as a counselor, I will contribute to build an inclusive and safer community. I will promote bilingualism. I will look into affordable housing, income tax, and family low income. Je suis bilingue, et pour tous ceux, les francophones qui sont là, dehors, qui nous regardent aujourd'hui, je vous remercie d'être venu aujourd'hui. Je suis Paul Rovin. Je vous invite à m'inviter à, à, à voter pour moi. I will look together with my colleagues. We will make this community being a better place to our children to raise and study. Thank you very much. Je vous remercie. Votez pour Paul Robin. Thank you, Paul. And thank you again to all the council of candidates and for all the attendees for uh, your participation tonight. Um, it's eight o'clock now. We're going to take a small break and begin again at 8.05 sharp as we prepare for the mayoral candidate session. So thank please you. remember to join us again, 8.05 sharp.
Hello, everybody. We need about one more minute to just get everything set. So uh, we'll be back at 8.07. Thank you. Was I supposed to unmute? It said spotlight. I'm waiting for all of them to get spotlighted. Okay. So welcome back everyone. And this is our mayoral candidate session of our forum this evening. Uh, the mayoral candidates are Jackie Clayton, Eunice Friesen, Glenn Gruner, and joining us later will be Brian Patricia. We're going to get right into the questions. Uh, first question is, as mayor, what value would you place on collaboration with the surrounding municipalities and other forms of government? And the order this time will be Eunice Friesen, Jackie Clayton, and then Glenn Gruner. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for hosting. I'm delighted to be here. Regional planning is utmost in my mind. Residents of the Peace Region don't really care where their municipal boundaries are, but they do want value for their taxes and access to jobs. They want recreation opportunities, and they want activities that enhance their lifestyles and their social interactions. And I am committed to laying the groundwork for successful collaboration. We did uh, have the intermunicipal collaboration framework, the cost sharing that will be solved. Uh, and set in um, April, and we look forward to taking the learnings from that, getting cost sharing out of it, and being able to move on to uh, better relationships and finding some things that we can collaborate on. Thank you, Eunice. Next up, Jackie. Good evening. Throughout my city council, life. Relationships that are truly essential for continued growth. In order for us to be taken to have a leader that is invited to these tables and is welcome to these discussions, there is no doubt that historically the both the city and the county and elected officials have been on opposing sides, leading their competitive nature rather than finding a common ground. Grand Prairie needs a mayor who leads with a collaborative mindset and one that is solution driven, benefiting both sides. I am that mayor. Thank you, Jackie. And Glenn. Is it working? You're on. All right. So um, I started the Hillside Neighborhood Association because of how bad the theft was getting. And I was basically bullied into it by a neighbor. But it worked out really good. We did a lot of good. Um, but things got worse, obviously, the last four years. Um, and now that's why I'm running. Um, so a lot of the issues, I'm not really going to have a position on because I'm sort of just focusing on trying to find a reason to stay in Grand Prairie, which is to fix all the problems that people tell me about, which I learned there's a lot of problems, but the main one, crime. And I'm good. 
Thank you, Lynn. And I see Brian Patricia has joined us. Brian, are you live right now? If you are, I'm going to read that question to you. Oh, I think I am. <laughs> Hang on. The, the question is. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna we'll, we'll do a, a new question. So the order for this round will be Glenn Gruner, uh, Eunice Friesen, Jackie Clayton, and Brian Trishan. So the question is: Tonight has had a lot of talk about adding things to the city of Grand Prairie. How do you plan on doing this without raising taxes? Glenn, the question goes to you first. Can I, pardon me, uh, yes, Dan, um, I just, you warbled a bit on that very first part. Could you repeat the question one more time, please? Sure. Tonight has had a lot of talk about adding things to the city of Grand Prairie. How do you plan on doing this without raising taxes? Glenn. All right. So when it comes to the budget, um, I realize that as soon as the election is over, we're pretty much hamstring for one year. But what I want to do is bring everyone that cares about government online to vote, to basically hijack representative direct democracy with direct democracy. Uh, I basically, I'm gonna get a hold of Solomon because I liked what he had to say and he's pretty much already earned my vote. So these issues basically will have to go to every single individual that cares enough about where their taxes go to go online and say what they want. Thank you, Glenn. Next up is Eunice. Thank you. Um, I am very proud that we reduced taxes this year by uh, on this four year term by close to 1% and that um, we did so with fiscal res responsibility and restraint. Um, we will be able to continue to keep taxes at a minimum. And I believe we can keep to just inflationary rates and learn to do a lot more with what we have through priority-based budgeting where administration aligns the budget with what's important to us and through lean initiatives where city staff identify improvements to save money and improve process. That gives us more money for other things. Thank you, Eunice. Jackie Clayton. Thanks, Dan. First and foremost, there was ideas discussed tonight, but once the new council is formed, you need to actually be built or spent on. You need to make the tough decisions that our community remains affordable. In this last term, we did work hard. I was the councillor that put forward a minus four in the first year of a four-year budget. We got to that through very tough decisions and discussions. However, through the year, we realized that there was some easy wins there. Our economy is still in recovery mode. We need to work hard to make our community affordable. I am the only mayor candidate that supported a 0% increase for this next budget cycle. There are technical issue with your connection, Jackie. Sorry, Dan, did you hear me at all then? Oh, we missed the last uh, sentence that you spoke there. Sure, I, I can just say the last sentence quickly. There are other options for consideration for the next council. However, 0% should always be an option. City of Grand Prairie residents deserve that. Okay, thank you, Jackie. And Brian. Uh, please unmute yourself, Brian. And Start whenever you're ready. Hey, Dan. Hi. I, I would bring forth, we have to start generating income. We don't have to increase taxes, or like Jackie said, to have a zero gain through existing facilities. Um, for example, the Eastlink Center, um, the Encana Center, not Encana Center, um, the downtown arena, and then we can push that revenue into growing the city. 
Hey, thank you, Brian. Okay, next question. The order will be Jackie Clayton, Clayton Gruner, Brian Patrician, and then Eunice Friesen. The question is, our mayor should have a deep understanding of our community. Can you please speak more to your commitment and experience volunteering, doing board work, and, uh, and community leadership? As your mayor, I absolutely have that experience. Through the, being in the Chamber of Commerce for six years, the Grand Prairie Regional College Board of Dr Governors, six years. I also worked on nonprofit organizations such as the Hospital Foundation, small groups such as Mamas for Mamas. I am passionately committed to our community. My relationships extend past the local level to provincial and federal levels. And I've worked very hard to establish those relationships. You have to have the relationships in order for our city to be successful. You have to be invited to the tables for discussion, but you have to put the time into these organizations. It's not a short period of time. It is a long commitment. I've been here since 1999. And since the day I got here, I've committed my time to this community. I truly believe that this community is. Time's up Jackie. Uh, Glenn, you're up next. And you need to unmute yourself, Glenn. All right, so um, like I said, Hillside Neighborhood Association, I helped form it, took two tries, but when the city announced they were gonna rezone Hillside, that got everyone out. Um, unfortunately, uh, I watched that process go by. Um, maybe now Friesen and Clayton recognize me. Probably not because this beard is very new. Um, and basically, I mostly just sat in the, in the back. I was a warm body so that we had enough council members. Um, but I saw what people, once they have the drive to do work, basically the president, she just went above and beyond. She did lots of stuff. But I only was there for crime, so I, I'm running the Neighborhood Eye program, so I do patrols, and uh, it's not exactly fun. Okay, thanks, Glenn. And Eunice. Thank you, Dan. Um, when I moved here in 1988, or when I, sorry, moved here in 1984, and by 1988, I was already a committed volunteer. I help out at anything that I have the capacity to help out at. I was on my children's school council. I've been involved in theater and I'm a, a recipient of the Jenny Tetro Long Service Award. I uh, volunteered for Special Olympics as a nurse back in, I think it was 1990. I was a board member on Odyssey House when we built the new women's shelter. I uh, was a director of the Chamber of Commerce. I sat on the GPRC Board of Directors and I also served uh, a term and was reappointed as a, an appeal panel member for the Minister of Social Services. Hey, thank you, Eunice. The next question, the order will be Brian, Jackie, Eunice, and then Glenn. And the question is, what would your vision or plan be for the Northwest part of the city? And begin with Brian. Not sure if you're not unmuting yourself, Brian, but we can't hear you. There you are. Oh, is that better? Yeah. Hey. Go ahead. Hey, Dan. Um, the northwest part of the city, I understand there's more residential buildings going into there, um, which is always great for housing to keep people working. I could see more commercial, like small business stores going in there. I wouldn't put much for large corporations. Um, I don't believe like large corporations would keep money within the city and keep everybody local, um, but that's what I would like to see there. Okay, thank you, Brian. Next up, Jackie Clayton. Thanks, Dan. 
Grand Prairie is absolutely a leader in many industries, but one that we need to consider for the Northwest area land that we annexed recently from the county is an agricultural plan. This could include vertical farming, partnering and collaboration through industry to use uh, gas to heat these greenhouses. 90% of an incinerator uh, is burning sweet gas, and in turn that sweet gas could be used to heat these greenhouses. There's opportunities of of uh, agricultural demands that we already plant, such as processing of peas, as well as processing of hemp and potentially oat processing. But the other thing to consider is vertical farming. Maybe we become the next leader of growing strawberries for Northern Alberta. We can partner and build P3 opportunities where we build the infrastructure uh, with partners, but allowing the private sector to get the best deal possible. Looking at these options. Thank you, Jackie, time's up. Uh, next up is uh, Eunice Friesen. Thank you, Dan. I wasn't sure which way to go. I thought maybe go in the direction that Jackie did, but since she did, I'll go in the other the other direction I was thinking about. So in the Northwest area, we have some significant new uh, uh, neighborhoods, including Arbor Hills and Royal Oaks and North and Hidden Valley. And we have a, a, a dearth of uh, recreational opportunities up there. So as the old comp, and the Leisure Center come down, we have a blank slate to create a recreational hub for that corner of the city. And it's, it saves right now, it's a really long drive down to the, down to the East Link place and to be able to um, figure it, something out that just so, so suits that end of the city would be really exciting. Thanks, Eunice. And to finish up that question, Glenn. Ah, there. Yeah, I remember when that uh, got adopted and became part of the city, um, people were pretty much not impressed and they thought it was a joke. Um, really, it seems like the city just wants to interfere with the highway because they're terrified of losing all the tourism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, that's an unfounded worry. Um, that part of the city, I mean, you could put something big in there, but it's just a horrible location. We should have went the other direction. I don't have a time machine. So back to direct democracy, see what people can make out of it. Crowdsource the idea basically. And I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. For the next question, the order will be Eunice Friesen, Brian Patrician, Glenn Gruner, and Jackie Clayton. The next question is, what role does the city play in supporting and ensuring the future success of GPRC? Eunice, please unmute yourself and begin when you're ready. You bet, thank you very much. Um, so I graduated from nursing in GP at GPRC in 1988, and it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, when I was on the Board of Governors, I donated 100% of my remuneration back to the learning lab at the new hospital. I just thought it was a great full circle. Um, GPRC fills a critically important role in our community, in our region, such that we can educate our kids here and keep them here. And we don't have to send them away and lose them. Um, we're at an unprecedented opportunity now to really select programs and services and, and uh, that actually fit what we need in our city with the polytechnic uh, status uh, arriving. So it's, a, it's an exciting. Thanks, Eunice. On to Brian. Uh, the city's role with GPRC, say we'd have to have a reason for people to come or students to come here and stay and get educated in the school. Um, so good infrastructure so they can commute back and forth, um, affordable housing so they're not drowning in student loans, um, parks and recreation because everybody wants to go have fun after class. Um, we just need to improve on those aspects and we'll see them come. Thank you, Brian. On to Glenn. Oh, this actually kind of applies to me a bit. Um, so I went to the U of A, they threw scholarships at me. So I like made money going the first year. You get to the second year though, um, the scholarships aren't there. And now I'm 
working with less money. I actually, my roommate was all crazy about GPRC and he said how much better it was because U of A, they just throw a book at you and you're on your own. Came back to GPRC, teachers were great. Um, you have to have a college in a city basically just to survive with the way our economy is going. Um, but you gotta have degrees that actually get you jobs. So uh, they pretty much already do that, but we're competing with the, the college north of us. Uh, I can't remember which one it is, Fairview. Uh, we should steal business from Sorry, Glenn, time's up. And we'll finish off with Jackie Clayton. Thanks, Dan. After my six years with the chamber, my second most favorite experience in volunteering was my six years with Grand Prairie Regional College. So I have a very solid understanding of the secondary, post-secondary system. We need to advocate the province so they as well appreciate and understand the importance of an educated society. We also need to advocate them for having seats when our economy slows down, not when our economy picks up. We need to bring the right people to the table and future opportunities for the college, in my opinion, include Grand Prairie Regional College being a center of excellence facility where we focus on gas, agricultural, forestry and medical research and development. In conjunction with the new hospital, this is a great opportunity. By bringing industry leaders and school boards to the table, as well as other level of governments, we can have these decisions. And time's up, Jackie. Uh, next round, we will start with Jackie Clayton, Eunice Friesen, Brian Patrician, and then Glenn Groner. And the question is, as mayor, you'll be looked upon to lead a team. What experience do you have on community boards and committees to successfully lead the next council towards succession or towards success? Sorry, uh, Jackie Clayton. As my experience I've discussed many times tonight. However, being a community leader involves many things, not only leading boards and not only owning small businesses, it means getting your hands dirty. And sometimes you need to fight for your community, whether it's fighting for a nonprofit that really needs more exposure, whether it's bringing the right people to the table. My experience through the chamber, through the college, through the hospital foundation, through organizations such Mamas for Mamas is truly a collaborative role and leading those organizations to future success. I think my history speaks for itself. You can see my long lengthy volunteer history on my website, jackieclayton.ca. Thank you, Jackie. Eunice? Thank you. So I have uh, both sat on and led boards and I have also worked as executive director at a nonprofit. And what is most important about the role of the chair and of the council um, in this case is the, the leadership needs to make sure that every voice is heard around that table. And we wanna make sure that because people have elected eight other individuals. It really is about the group and building consensus and collaboration to get the best that we can get for Grand Prairie. So my role will really to be uh, make sure that everyone at the table is heard and the best decisions are made. Okay, thank you, Eunice. On to Brian. So far for leadership, I've been supervisor, of a few other companies for managing their shop. Um, so I work with a team of six to 10 other employees. And I agree with Eunice as everybody, we have a council of eight plus the mayor, everybody has to have their voice heard. If they have questions, you give them enough time to express their opinion. And so everybody can make an informed decision. Hey, thank you, Brian. And Glenn. So I'm a bit of a fence sitter. Um, I get in arguments with liberals and conservatives, but not about the normal things. It's, uh, it's usually the things the liberals and conservatives agree on that I'm like, you might wanna think about that a little bit harder. Like uh, donating clothes and food to certain African nations backfired because their main industry were textiles and farming. And we destroyed those nations Biden just destroyed Afghanistan um, and I'm watching my city get destroyed and I'm not exactly a community leader. I'm only standing up now because the choice is save the city or get out of the cities. 
And if you go online, that's what everyone is saying. Get out of the cities, get out. Okay, thank you, Glenn. So the next order of questions will go to Glenn, Brian, Jackie, and Eunice. And the question is, how would you describe the job of mayor? So Glenn, please begin. How would you describe the job of mayor? I have not been able to watch the uh, in-camera meetings, the ones that we don't get to see, or as I like to call them, the secret council meetings. So I don't really know what is said behind back doors. I only know what people say about politicians. And I, not a fan of politicians myself, um, but as individuals, I think most people that get in this role are really good people and they care about the community and stuff. That's not me. I care about myself, but I'm in a situation where like this community needs my help in the sense that I need everyone else to help me help them. Direct democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Brian. I believe the role of the mayor should be you have to lead the people to a better tomorrow um, through smart financial decisions and accountability for the money spent. The people elect all your officials, so they put you there to better where they live. Um, you have to be a good public speaker and have the drive to look into tomorrow and not waver and not turn your back. That's all. Thank you, Brian. Jackie, you're next. Thanks, Dan. Uh, in reality, the mayor is somebody who presides over the council meetings, uh, manages the code of conduct and participants from the other councillors. Uh, it also means bringing people together. Sometimes you see around the council table, not everybody is participating. You need to bring opinions out, but you also need to bring the team together. Within the organization, you need to bring people together so that they can collaborate and bring out each other's strengths. Pulling out the strengths from people is a really important important part of that. Serving as your interim mayor, it's provided me the opportunity to learn and appreciate the day-to-day -day organizational operations within the city. It's also given me a chance to see how extremely hard the employees of the city work. So bringing those two uh, components together, the strong working city employees, as well as the very passionate. Sorry, time's up, Jackie. We'll finish that question with Eunice Friesen. Thank you. Um, as Jackie said, the chair, the uh, mayor presides over the city, really running the meeting and making sure that um, code of conduct is followed and that uh, every voice at the table is heard, as I mentioned earlier. So the mayor must be a good communicator who gets along with everyone. And uh, after council meetings, the mayor often comes and is the voice of the council. And that voice of the council needs to be someone who clearly cares about the city the mayor does need to demonstrate that caring for the people, our residents, and uh, also to bring together people in a collaborative way to make, again, the best decisions that we can for the city. Thank you, Eunice. And the next question is, how would you attract investment to the city? Oh. Sorry, Dan, I don't think you identified sorry. who's answering in what order. Oh, sorry. Yes, I was muted for a second. I see that. Uh, the order is Brian, Eunice, Glenn, and Jackie. So how would you attract investment to the city, starting with Brian? I would start with infrastructure upgrades, uh, possible incentives for small businesses, for startup like low interest startup loans or grants from the city um, large corporations uh, any any land that the city owns we could make a fair offer to purchase to bring their businesses to us that's about it okay, thank you brian 
Eunice. Thank you. So we certainly need to get uh, areas like Hughes Lake serviced and ready, even if we need to do interim servicing until um, we're ready, we need to have it um, ready to immediately and confidently sell as an opportunity. Um, one thing though that uh, I'd really like to consider is putting an environmental, social and governance strategy lens on the operations of the city. Investors are now looking for partners who have strong ESG programs and strategies. That means what do we do for the environment? What do we do for the social um, problems in our city and how do we govern? And that is what investors are looking for. If we want to attract investors, we need to make Grand Prairie what it is. Yes. Glenn, you're next. Yeah, investment's a hard one when uh, pipelines are keep getting canceled on us. Um, probably our best bet is actually GPRC um, and then uh, change the rules so that you can just flood in basically uh, Chinese students, um, Vietnam as well. Um, we're really missing an opportunity by, because uh, like China's booming. We used to try and fight it, but uh, both sides pretty much agreed now that China's the future. And uh, we're like Cretchen's out there getting investments. So like Grand Prairie really needs to pick, pick a side basically and either go in all, all in on cheap Chinese products and uh, help educate their masses so that they become a lot more like us and maybe, you know, democracy. And I'm done. Thanks, Glenn. And finishing off, Jackie. Thanks, Dan. The city has a lot of opportunities when it comes to the future of investment. We need to, as a council, we need to build those opportunities to fruition and really amplify what is available out there. Consideration always needs to be given to P3s, but we also have to be at the table. If we're not at the table for discussions to provide opportunities and show the world what is actually available in Grand Prairie, we're never gonna get considered in those discussions. Discussions and decisions are made outside of Grand Prairie, but Grand Prairie always needs to be considered. My strong relationships within the corporate world and the government will allow me to bring the right players to the table. While the private sector designs and builds projects, the public sector can bring the right people to, ta to the table. This is always overseen by administration. And that's time's up, Jackie. So the next question, the order will be Eunice, Jackie, Glenn, and Brian. Um, and I am gonna insert my own question being moderator of this uh, this event tonight. My question has to do with the downtown. With over $50 million invested in the downtown, it's a shame. It looks like it's being overrun by the homeless. Looks like COVID is crushing the retailers there. What is your vision for the next step for the downtown city center? Eunice. Thank you. Um, thank goodness we're near to the end of the uh, work that needed to be done downtown and it did need to be done so that we could begin to rebuild with some um, higher density housing and bring bodies people downtown but yes right now we have uh, an issue with about 200 and some homeless people in Grand Prairie we're making steps now to house these people in appropriate housing one is the coordinated care campus that we have purchased the stone bridge for there's going to be other needs for housing for them as well We'll take care of that over the coming years, but then we need to really invest in attracting people and excitement and festivals back downtown, and we will. Thanks, Eunice. Jackie. Thanks so much, Dan. I uh, have to say that the downtown is uh, absolutely a discussion of topic everywhere you go. But for me, it's something that I believe in so much. I personally invested in it. I, I bought a building downtown. I moved my business into it. And I daily am visited by people that are also investing downtown. City of Grand Prairie had 27 new businesses open recently. And a lot of them were focused downtown. We do have some crime issues downtown. However, Having a more vibrant uh, downtown will help with that. We also have to look at community safety initiatives and opportunities such as grants where buildings can invest in their building with support from the city helps create a safer community. Investing in downtown, the significant amount of it is done, but we need to recognize the value of it does for building a strong community and working with. Thank you, Jackie. Glenn. 
question goes over to you. Boy, I should uh, get my software running and uh, conduct a poll and see exactly how many people <laughs> think the money was spent well. Um, mostly, I think the fact that it looks really bad already because it's been damaged if you go and look. And then when you start looking up the price tags for like the, the zipper pattern was something like 50K. Um, pretty much everyone quickly veers in one direction. They love it or they hate it. Um, but it seems like the more information they learn, the more they hate it. But uh, I mean, it's in the past. We got to focus on the future. So I'm going to focus on voting on getting people to vote on like what to do next, not uh, placing blame or uh, there's no point talking about it. It's it's done deal. Keep move forward. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Brian. With downtown, with our the work that's been done there throughout the last four years, I've seen a lot of businesses almost in a chokehold because the construction removes their flowing consumer. Um, so we have to bring once the construction's finished, we have to bring that flow back um, with the increased crime down there it should be possible to put either a bicycle or a foot patrol but with greater businesses downtown and not empty buildings that should almost resolve itself um, and fix the issue um, the stone bridge was purchased as housing for the homeless sorry time's up brian uh, next question, the order will be Glenn, Jackie, Eunice, and then Brian again. And the question is, with the current state of COVID crisis, the healthcare emergency and the province's lack of appropriate direction, what actual measures can the city take to curb the crisis and promote vaccinations within our community? So Glenn. <laughs> Wow. Oh, so this is a topic that, see, I broke my foot uh, beginning of 2020. So I was on the internet. So I watched it all play out. And um, the polarization has people spreading lies in both camps to the point where I hate the topic so much. And then I got COVID and I stopped caring once I had it because like I'm immune at that point. And that's another thing I have to argue about because some people think you can get it twice. No, you can't. Um, but uh, I understand people are upset and I have a position on it now that basically I went to a store and there's issues, but I'm not, it's mostly theft I care about, but once again, direct democracy, people get to decide for themselves. Hey, thank you, Glenn. Uh, Jackie, you're, you're next. Thanks so much, Dan. As being the interim mayor, I have absolutely had the opportunity to talk about COVID a lot. I think that our role has clearly been identified. It's not our decision at the, at the municipal level. We have to continue to advocate and we have to continue to lobby the province. They need to step up in their role of guiding municipalities. We don't have healthcare professionals on staff to make these decisions. And we're left making decisions that are not in our scope of daily work. Municipal politicians can encourage and spread the, the health measures information, but we can't make those decisions on a daily basis. Hey, Jackie, thank you. And Eunice. Thank you, Dan. Um, it is the municipality's responsibility to support the businesses in our communities and the individuals in our communities as they seek to um, live their lives in a way that has been imposed on them through public health, health measures. We have been asked to consider mask mandates. Again, we had been asked to encourage vaccinations and social distancing and all the other measures. And we dragged our feet a little bit about doing that, but that's where we're at now anyway. Um, so once these measures are in place, uh, if a uh, the business decides they have to put in the, the exemption program, it's up to us to support them in doing that. And if they don't, it is up to us to support them that way as well. Thanks, Eunice. To close, close out this question, Brian. My belief is people have, can choose for themselves, um, getting vaccinated, not getting vaccinated. It is, it's, it's your body, it's your choice. 
whether you wear a mask or you don't, once again, it's the clothing you wear, it's your choice. Um, AHS, them claiming that the hospitals are overrun. I noticed in a few previous months, they've cut pay to your nurses. So it's not hard to overrun a hospital when you have a staffing issue. Um, but I'm very pro-choice and you should not push your beliefs onto somebody else, medical or otherwise. Okay, thank you, Brian. And this will be the last question for our mayoral candidate. GP has seen significant growth, growth in recent, recent years, but there is much vacant space throughout our city. What do you believe is more important, building new commercial space or revitalizing and better utilizing our existing commercial districts? So we'll begin with uh, Jackie. Thanks, Dan. Just like a zero budget should always be considered, reinvesting uh, into existing infrastructure should always be considered. We don't need to always build new Taj Mahals. We absolutely can repurpose facilities, and that should always be a consideration. We have some substantial large buildings left empty right now. However, when you talk to commercial realtors, there's actually a lot of leases that are taking place. The lease rates are a little lower, and with the increase in our economy, those rates will be driven up. However, we can't continue to think that our, our community is empty. We can work with the city economic development to fill those large empty buildings that are at the, like the Sears, the Canadian Tires, the IGAs. However, overall, our role is to continue Continue to create a strong economy and not always build new. Hey, thank you. Uh, we're getting a little bit of feedback, so everyone, please make sure you're muted when you're not speaking. Next speaker is Glenn. Um, so the free market will take care of that. Um, so then it's a question of how many bodies you get back into Grand Prairie. Um, obviously, oil boom helps. Um, natural gas is kind of our thing. Um, natural gas is going to keep booming as it pushes out coal and we watch the green energies fail because that's what most of them are doing because without subsidies, they don't work. Uh, someone, they were talking about geothermal before. Yeah, that, that's, we're not Saskatchewan. You have to, the problem is geothermal has a time span before you run out of heat to, that you can suck up. So I, I just, I know so much stuff and there's not enough time to explain it all. Um, but we just need to get the economy going and all those empty spots will fill up because we're not like Japan, uh, house values go up with time. Hey, thank you, Glenn. Uh, Brian, you're next. Traveling on the west side industrial park five days a week. I see a lot of empty buildings. I believe we have to repair what we have and fill those buildings before we expand or we end up just having an empty shell for our downtown sec or downtown core um so we should have incentive to bring companies into the city and take over those leases or purchase the land and the buildings to drive the city back to greatness Thank you, Brian. And finishing off this topic, Eunice. Thank you. So real estate activity is directly linked to a thriving city that attracts and retains residents and sustains businesses. So it relates back to every other strategy we've talked about so far tonight. Um, more residents trigger more need for businesses and services. And working in close coordination with the real estate com community we can determine the uh, best fits for the market for the next few years and where we can't, where we have, um, where we have vacant space and we may have more because of the pandemic and people working from home. We then develop plans to address and uh, to repurpose some buildings and we have to create a pathway that the city creates a pathway to let that happen. Yes, thank you, Eunice. Okay, so it comes we're at that point in our program now where we're going to hear closing remarks from our mayoral candidates. Closing remarks, again, could be 
uh, on any of the responses that you maybe felt that you didn't cover thoroughly enough, or it can just be anything. You could highlight something about yourself that you feel hasn't been covered yet to let the voters know who you are. And the order for this by random draw is going to be Brian Patrician, Jackie Clayton, Eunice Friesen, and Glenn Bruner. Brian, you have one and a half minutes for this one. Thanks, Dan. Um, I've been up in Grand Prairie for 16 years now and seen the slow decline of the infrastructure, road repair, snow removal, um, our parks in the city. My four year focus is on them. People drive to work every day. They don't appreciate wrecking their suspension on their vehicle because vehicles have a high enough cost already. Um, we need to get a strong foundation in this city so people have the incentive to move and come and work here. And by doing that, we should be able to lower our taxes because I'm not proud to be number one in Alberta for personal property taxes. And that's about it. Thank you, Brian. On to Jackie. Thanks, Dan. And thanks to all of you who are watching tonight. I am Jackie Clayton, and I'm extremely proud to call Grand Prairie my home. Here, I'm raising my family, volunteering in my community, and contributing to the economy with my small business. I'm dedicated and committed to our community and have given extensive authentic time to many local organizations as a leader and a volunteer. As interim mayor, I have amplified my past eight years of council experience to the next level with collaborative and inclusive work, allowing me to have a full understanding of how to serve you as your mayor. I'm not afraid to ask the tough questions or have difficult conversations. For you, I have created an outline of five things covering how I will continue to be a committed leader who connects our city's future while creating serious impact as your mayor. You can view this framework on my website, JackieClayton.ca. You've heard me speak on some of my platform issues tonight, but I have a lot more to share. I'll be releasing my entire platform later this week on my website, JackieClayton.ca. These topics include some things that we've covered here tonight, plus solution-driven budgeting for an affordable community, effective photo radar focused on improved community safety, increased neighborhood and recreational amenities, an authentic commitment to support our seniors community and forward thinking economic development and tourism initiatives. Thank you so much for your time tonight and please vote Jackie Clayton. Thanks Jackie. Eunice Friesen. Thank you. Grand Prairie has had a tough go, no question, with some economic depression and social disconnect on the heels of a pandemic and I see nothing but opportunity. I am prepared to invest in our traditional economic drivers and into attracting new industries. I am prepared to capitalize on the opportunities in healthcare, education, and our anticipated population growth over the next 10 years. And I am prepared to invest in quality of life so that businesses can have happy, healthy, healthy workforce, living in a community that is socially connected and safe. Economic growth and social responsibility are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they are interdependent, and I have experience delivering both. My foundational education is in nursing, and I'm currently studying leadership in my MBA. I have managed a line of business for a publicly traded oil field services company, and I was the first executive director of the Grand Prairie Primary Care Network. I have served three appointments for two different provincial ministries, and my private business was awarded Small Business of the Year in 2019. As a counselor, I have consistently supported initiatives aimed at driving our economy and supporting our quality of life for residents while advocating for sustainable tax control measures. My relationships with the city and the province are ones of mutual respect. Am I back on? I went off and got, was that a mistake? I think that, I think that was time. I think something happened. It didn't get muted. But thank you, Eunice. Thank you. Uh, we we'll give them a chance to just reset the timer. And Glenn, you get to finish off. So I was very last minute, um, about 30 minutes more and I would have missed the deadline. Um, I was out collecting signatures only over one day. Uh, I discovered I don't like knocking on doors because I don't like having my door knocked on. 
So I just wandered around until I saw someone outside and I said, hey, and I got them to sign. And uh, I am a pessimist, but uh, I mean, my win, uh, depending on how things go. Um, I, I like that Solomon said that he wasn't a politician. Um, someone I know contacted me and I went to his business and I saw he had Solomon's flyers out. So I kind of had a good feeling like this person I haven't talked to in about 20 years, trusted this guy. And so I, I don't, I don't feel alone now. Um, when I formed the neighborhood association, helped form it, uh, it helped a bit, um, but it also kind of, I saw how the interest really waned, especially after Hillside was rezoned against our wishes. Um, and of course, the last two years have been very interesting, or the year and a half, have been very interesting for the whole world. And uh, guys like me that are fence sitters, um, this might be our time to not really unite people, but uh, find common ground. So basically, I'm going to go with 75% majority voting online before we do anything, because I feel like 50, it would just flip flop back and forth as people get aware, like, hey, the city's going to do this, and then they'd rush online to vote differently. So the software started out as something for the neighborhood association originally, just so they didn't have to come to the meetings. Thank you, Glenn. And thank you to all our candidates. Uh, the Grand Prairie and District Chamber of Commerce thanks all candidates for participating tonight and for the responses to our pre-forum questions, which will be posted on our website prior to the advanced polls on October 8th. Thank you for letting your name stand for the election, which shows a commitment uh, which shows your commitment to being a part of the continued growth of our city. Um, I do apologize for those participants out there who submitted questions and we didn't get around to them. Um, there will be opportunity for you to uh, get, a, get a hold of these candidates um, because they're still out there campaigning. Tonight's forum just gives you a glimpse of what they stand for, for the issues, their backgrounds and whatnot. Um, they are out there doing more work every day. Uh, you see them putting up signs, you see them posting on their websites or on social media. Um, get out there, I encourage everyone, get out there and get to learn who these uh, candidates are for council and for mayor, because um, it's that's our duty. Their job is to carry that information going forward. And they're the ones who get elected for four years to do the hard work, but we got to put them in, in place. So, uh, that's, that's the small ask that we have of you. I wanna thank uh, the staff and my fellow directors of the chamber for help this evening. Uh, and thanks to all of you in the audience for your questions and participation. We encourage everyone eligible to cast your vote in either the advanced polls or on election day to go out and vote on October 18th. I just wanna remind everyone as well, you're not only uh, voting for um, your eight, the makeup of your eight council, so you can vote for up to eight councillors. Don't spoil your ballot by voting for nine or more. Um, you can do anything from one to eight, depending on how you strategically want to vote. Then vote for one mayor, and you also have your choice of school board trustees that you're voting for. And as well, for the first time, uh, in my experience, we are also voting on that same ballot for federal senator nominees. So get to know your, who those are as well. There are more than a dozen of them running for a senator and they will represent Alberta at the federal Senate. So with that, thank you everyone. Again, uh, we can't do this without you um, and we wish you all the best. Good night. <laughs>